All right, everybody, welcome to the Expedition One podcast. Today we have a very special guest. Uh, as always, I have Sarah with me. She is going to be my uh, my co person that she always co-person. is. My co person, <laughs> my co host. Um, she's she's a lot of co things for me, which is pretty sweet. But anyway, so I've got Sarah here, and uh, we have a very special guest today. Our guest is Kurt Williams from Cruiser Outfitters. If you haven't heard of Kurt. Um, You should have because Kurt (laughs) is pretty amazing. We're going to go through a lot of neat stuff here. And when it comes down to Kurt, I'm going to give you the most important piece of him. Um, Besides being an engineer and being an entrepreneur, um, running Cruiser Outfitters for many years now, because Cruiser Outfitters actually is kind of a legacy company, which is kind of cool. It's been around since I was uh, in my teens. Uh, Kurt has kept it alive and growing. Um, On top of that, did I say mechanical engineer? Was that in there? Not yet. Um, he's a mechanical engineer, um, and he is a world traveler and has done some amazing overlanding. And again, I think I did say a walking encyclopedia of land cruiser knowledge. That's your definition. Not did mine. I say that? Okay. Well, <laughs> I appreciate you, that. You, you definitely know more land cruiser than anyone I know, man. Okay. So, well, you make me sound a lot cooler than I really am. So thank well, you for that. I do my best. Very kind of you. I think you are very cool, Kurt. I mean, don't be surprised. Don't don't be, don't be fooled <laughs> by your own head. Okay, I'm telling you, you're well, a cool dude. Well, appreciate you having me today. This yeah, is fun. Thanks for thanks it's for coming. Good to on. hang out and chat. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, this is kind of fun. This is episode four, fourth oh, episode. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're excited. really rolling with this. Okay, I'm excited <laughs> to be part of it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and hopefully you'll come on again because you know there'll always be new stuff to talk about. So, Kurt. Was there anything I missed out on talking about you? I think that covers the bases that really well. Bases. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think there's so much we can talk about. There's a ton of t- to talk about here, but um, I want to get a little more information. Let's start with just Cruiser Outfitters itself because I mentioned that. So how old is Cruiser Outfitters as far as the name, the company, the brand? Cruiser Outfitters started in 1992, so mm-hmm. definitely before I could even drive. And I think, like you, I, I, I remember yeah. it as a teenager, uh, just a little bit as well as a 15-year-old as I started hunting down Land Cruisers. Mm-hmm. There was a shop in Salt Lake that was really in its infancy then, but had just known about it. So somewhere in the 91, 92 range, I've never been able to put an exact figure on that mm-hmm. because in that day, just the records were different and there wasn't websites. You couldn't kind of dig back. But yeah, 91, 92, somewhere right in that time frame. Mm-hmm. So okay. it started in Salt Lake. It was a couple of uh, local Land Cruiser guys. They uh, they saw kind of the writing on the wall that there was going to be this market for Land Cruiser repair, service, and accessories, and they spooled it up. It had a few different locations in downtown Salt Lake, and it wasn't until about 1996 was the first time I went there. I actually went and bought a roll bar. Mm-hmm. I had just picked up this FJ40, and my dad had said, "You're not going to like take that off road till you get a roll bar in it," oh. and it was it was missing the factory roll bar. So I like called this place and here's this 16 year old kid driving down there like I need a roll bar for my FJ40 and they were very kind and took care of me and had a used one he sold me and that started a a relationship that obviously uh, over a lot of years got to started working there and just buying more parts and then in the the time came in 2001 that the previous owner uh, still a dear friend his name's Daryl Norda he decided he wanted to go be an underwater dive welder of all things like Mm -hmm. a commercial diver so he uh, was basically liquidating the business of like any of the assets. We sold a lot of used parts to a big company in California that specializes in used parts. And I took over what was left, which was like the name, the bank account with nothing in it, and mm-hmm. like a truckload <laughs> of parts that couldn't be returned elsewhere. But, mm. but what it had and what was important to me is one, uh, a lot of a local following of customers, some really dear customers that had uh, you know, used Cruiser Outfitters as their source for parts but also these accounts, like accounts with companies like ARB and Advanced Adapters and some Mm -hmm. of these early uh, companies that were making Land Cruiser parts. So that was the big thing to me is like, man, I can't see that just go away. We were one of the early uh, Mm -hmm. ARB dealers even before they were selling direct in the US before they had US presence. Mm. Daryl was ordering some stuff Mm -hmm. from overseas kind of right as they were their formative years as well. Uh, But yeah, I just saw some value in that. And at the time, I was a full-time student. That's actually where you and I first kind of met and got to know each other a little bit as we were both mm-hmm. doing engineering up at the University of Utah. Yeah. And I never thought Cruiser Outfitters was going to be a full-time gig. Like, mm-hmm. never saw that as being my end game. It mm-hmm. was really, a, I like Land Cruisers. I like playing with Land Cruisers. Love selling parts because that means I'm hanging out with other Land Cruiser guys. 
Mm -hmm. And if it gets me through school, perfect win-win. So fast forward to 2006, I'm getting ready to graduate up at the U and really starting to look at like quote unquote real jobs. Like I'm going to go get this engineering job that I just went to school for all these years for. Mm -hmm. And it was an undergraduate professor of mine that he knew what I was doing. I was working on a, I did a, a project called Formula Baja where we built, or SAE Baja, right. excuse me. Yeah. We built a, a little off-road race car as our senior project, went and raced that. it against other schools. Mm -hmm. And he was our, our uh, advisor for that, our professor. And he was the one that said like, why well, go get an engineering job, man? Like you, you came to school all these years to be a thinker and a problem solver. Like you've got this little company, why don't you do that? And I was like, mind blown. Like, really? You're going to tell me I just went to school all these years and I'm just going to still do this little business I've been doing after hours. And, and I'm really glad he did say that. I, I get the chance to see him every, usually every year up at design day, up at the U, go back and get mm -hmm. a shake his hand and say hello again. We've stayed in contact a little over the years on other things. And I thank him all the time for saying that. So 2006, I graduate and I just started doing cruiser outfitters at that point full time. So here we are 15 years later now, mm -hmm. still a full time gig. Yeah. I remember, I mean, so when I remember the old, where, where they, I can't remember exactly where they were, but I just remember it was like the original tr cruiser outfit. Mm -hmm. It was like, I don't even remember that they had like in, that was indoors. It seemed like it was like covered. There was a covered area across covered it, was area. Old, it was down by the old ballpark in downtown yeah. Salt Lake, yeah. right by the, uh, the time, like Franklin Coven, Covey stadium at that mm -hmm. time, it's kind of had a few different names. And it was right there and they did have like four bays of shop and then like there was a lot of stuff that was like covered in it, mm -hmm. like an outside area yeah. of used parts and did a lot of used parts when i got hired there that's what i he daryl kind of was this how old was i 20 years old said yeah. like you come take all these land cruisers apart because he would buy wrecks rolls crash right, cruisers right. use them for used parts and but he had them kind of piling up outside like to the point it was like impacting the ability to to do business or get in and out like just needed to get those cleared out so I spent uh, an entire probably six months just taking apart old Land Cruisers. I'd we'd get one, Dang. we'd put it on the trailer, yeah. take it all apart like everything of value, and then would use the leftover carcass to fill full of other parts from other Land Cruisers we parted out. But in exchange, yeah. I got all of the parts I needed to build my blue FJ40 that I actually still have right. to this day. So I kind of built that beautiful. while I was yeah. taking it apart. And it's it's a little worse for wear after all these years. It's, I can you know, imagine. But it's, it still it's, looks great though. That's well, been a fun cruiser, and it's been all over I mean, the Western U.S. I've, yeah. You know, done the Rubicon all over Moab, Nevada, up into Idaho and Colorado. It's it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. So sweet cruiser. Don't know if I'll ever sell it these days, but I that's cool. I but that's how it, it. that's how it all started. It's kind then. of an icon. It's like it's you know what I mean. Like you think how many years you've had it, and you have gone everywhere in that thing. So yeah, twenty about yeah, just about twenty years now. In fact, I've, yeah, I've had it over twenty years, but I've been driving it for about yeah. twenty years now. That's what's crazy too is you're still driving it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. kind of trips me out a little bit. A little bit, just because it's kind of like, okay, you, you have your other v rigs and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but you still, I'll, I'll, you'll still post every once in a while and I'll see that you're out. Oh, yeah. I'm out willing it and everything mm -hmm. like that, dude. I make a crazy. point of taking it out at least on one or two big, you know, big trips a year, some good overnighters or mm -hmm. something longer, just to like remember what it's like to drive an old FJ40. Mm -hmm. and it, it makes you appreciate every one of yeah. those other vehicles that much more. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I love Land Cruisers and, and fortunate to have a few different models, but. Uh, there's something that just makes you smile when you get in an old one that has like a manual choke cable and you have to <laughs> let it warm up a little bit, you know, the heat burns your right foot and your left foot's frozen. It's, it's a special <laughs> feeling that you'll only get if you drive a Land Cruiser or any yeah. older vehicle, right? Yeah. Like everyone's got that nostalgia mm -hmm. vehicle that they, they feel that way about. Yeah. Um, so that's, so with Cruiser Outfitters, right? When Anatole decided, not Anatole, sorry. Daryl. Daryl, yeah, right? and I know Anatole had something to do with that somewhere in there. They but did, I don't yeah. Know there whatever was whatever happened to him. Yeah, but. there was the. the I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that real quick because it's interesting. Like all the cruiser guys actually started uh, in the same little circle in Salt right. Lake in the late '80s, early '90s, and they, as kind of partnerships, kind of can happen at times. They all spun off and started their own thing, and there was off-road engineering and cruiser engineering and cruisers only. And there was like a few of these different shops in Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. um, I actually managed to get along with all of them at the time. I think they had all kind of split off for a reason and it wasn't because they were best friends, right? They, they right. started their own company. So yeah. when I first got involved, uh, even with, with Daryl Cruiser Outfitters, they wouldn't talk, some of the shops wouldn't talk to each other. They were, you know, mm -hmm. like five, 10 minutes away from each other, but they wouldn't sell parts <laughs> to each other. And, I, and when I got involved later, I was like, I will sell parts to anybody, you know, like bring it on. Yeah. 
But uh, that, that's funny. Yeah. So Daryl was Cruiser Outfitters. Anatol was Off Road Engineering. If I'm oh, not mistaken. Right. And yep, I think yep. Anatol had worked at Cruiser Engineering before, which is where mm-hmm. Mark was partners with Dave at Cruiser Engineering. Yeah. And Mark started, you know, Cruiser. So it's this long little weave of uh, I call it as the Burfield turns, like the <laughs> the Utah Land Cruiser story. <laughs> A little bit of drama back in the day. Nowadays, yeah. it's totally docile. Everybody yeah. gets along really well. No, that's cool. That's good. Yeah, and so that I just remember coming to your house actually because I needed an ARB compressor. Mm-hmm. I it was so one of the projects that I worked on, um, something that the U of U was doing, which was really cool, and I was up there in school. Mm-hmm. Was it was um, I just can't remember what it's called, but basically they gave like a, a grant. It was like a thousand dollar grant for a project, right? Um, and they opened it up for anybody that was doing sciences. Um, and I needed a compressor to, to, I was using the compressor for my actuator, uh, for a sway bar disconnect system for my TJ back there Mm -hmm. behind us. Yeah. And, uh, I remember like contacting, somebody told me to contact you cruiser contact cruiser outfitters. Right. So I contacted cruiser outfitters, which was you. And now I'm driving to Sandy. And so I'm coming to your house and I'm like, Oh, this is different. Right. Cause I hadn't seen cruiser outfitters for years. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy to see. So where you had it, you were, you were in your garage, mm-hmm. right? You get through school, you get a house, you have it in your backyard effectively, mm-hmm. right? And now you're in your own building, right? Yeah. And part of that growth and not always knowing what I plan to do, you're absolutely right in, like when I was in school running it, when you came to visit, and I absolutely remember that. You bought some ARB solenoids and mm-hmm. ARB compressor yep. and you were building that uh, air actuated sway bar disconnect, mm-hmm. which was such a cool... Back then, that nobody would heard of that. Now we got yeah. like auto manufacturers yeah. for all putting that <laughs> yeah, on their vehicles. Yeah, you were certainly ahead mm-hmm. of your time in, in planning that. Uh, but yeah, I ran it. Actually, that was my parents' house. I was a full-time college student. I was in my you know late teens, early twenties, and uh, was had taken over Cruiser Outfitters and uh, ran that there. And then yeah, I bought a house. We the the house we bought uh, we did on purpose because it had room behind the house to build a big shop with like a separate entrance and exit off of the street right. behind. So that was kind right. of part of why we did that. Built mm-hmm. the building and then. Yeah, a few years back, moved in and, and bought a building in Murray, where we're at now, that's mm-hmm. given us a lot of room to grow. So it's kind of just always been a little bit of a progression, and I'm kind of conservative on our growth in that regard, just kind of always watchful of what the economy's doing, and mm-hmm. and recognizing that uh, selling old Land Cruiser parts, and, and mind you, we do parts for brand new Land Cruisers too, mm-hmm. but there is some shelf life on old Land Cruiser parts, just as, as right. vehicles get older or harder to find the parts some of that stuff just gets discontinued but right. we've still been fortunate to have uh, really good access and inventory on a lot of those older parts to this day mm-hmm. uh, some of our most popular sellers are for vehicles they haven't made for 40 years yeah. so pretty pretty interesting but i wouldn't have thought that 20 years ago that they would have continued to be this popular but as we've seen in all things four by four everything vintage is popular right now when it comes mm-hmm. to early broncos oh, yeah. wagoneers oh, early yeah. jeeps land cruisers certainly no different i mean international scouts if you would have said mm. told me 15 20 years ago that scouts were going to be worth the values they're at today i would have like laughed at you like the going rate of a scout 15 20 years ago was like get it out of my backyard oh, yeah. Yeah. that was yeah. the going <laughs> price and now i've yeah. got scouts hitting like hundred thousand dollar plus oh, scouts wow. by some of these really high dollar scout and they're modernized and modern drivetrain mm-hmm. they're beautiful mm-hmm. vehicles but even just nicely restored scouts are worth a lot of money these days and mm-hmm. again wagoneers cherokees all those older models so it's cool mm-hmm. to see Land cruisers have been uh, fortunate in that same regard, and it's been good for us as a business to still have those parts available. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, is basically when it comes down to it, give, let's let's talk let's do history on let's do some cruiser history. Okay. Right? All right. <laughs> this, this is this is my my world. This is your world. <laughs> so, where did the Land Cruiser come from? I mean, other than Japan. Japan. Yeah. yeah Japan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So Toyota was a, an existing company. They were mm-hmm. Toyota Loom Works. They were in textile industries and had some other involvements. Uh, post-war, so you know, post-World War II, they uh, started to get into the automotive world. And they had done some stuff even a little earlier, pre-war stuff, but in the, the Land Cruiser itself uh, happened. You could really look at it as like late or early 50s is when it really spawned is like at the AK-10. It's a model that we've, no one's ever seen in person, but there's you know photos of an early prototype. But by like the uh, kind of early 50s as well and into the mid 50s, you started seeing like actual production model Land Cruisers or predecessors to the Land Cruiser. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're fortunate at the Land Cruiser Heritage Museum in Salt Lake. There is an example of a pre-Land Cruiser Toyota. So it's a Toyota 4x4, but it did not have the name Land Cruiser on it. That that name wasn't used yet. What year was this? That's a That model there is a 1953. Is it? 
good condition. Excellent. It's actually in really good condition it? all in. It's not a perfect pure survivor, but yeah. given it's a 1953 and there's right. maybe a dozen of this type of vehicle in existence around the world, mm -hmm. it's in fantastic condition wow. if you look at it that way. Yeah. Uh, so that's a really neat model before they... Uh, that, that's like one of the first vehicles you'll see if you visit the Land Cruiser Museum in Salt Lake and you'll notice that it doesn't say Land Cruiser anywhere on it. Though it mm -hmm. certainly has the look of a Land Cruiser, but also the look a little bit of a, a Willys and a Power Wagon. It was a little oh, bit wow. of a meld. Uh -huh. Toyota was certainly looking at competitors at that time and seeing what other vehicles were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. government was in Japan with post-occupied Japan, kind of helping rebuild economy mm -hmm. and setting up companies. Mm -hmm. So they were definitely looking to build uh, this 4x4 vehicle and it took off from there. Hmm. So when did it become, when did they actually give it the name? So like 1955, 1956 time frame that we started seeing the name Land Cruiser appear and mm -hmm. then 1957 was like the 20 series mm -hmm. and we have, there's a 1958 model in the museum there that's one of the first, if not the first Land Cruiser that came to the United States is, is there wow. in Salt Lake as well. So it's a really neat place to get to see all that heritage in a row. Mm -hmm. And that's, they were certainly the name Land Cruiser at that point. It was not known as a, it wasn't a household name. But you certainly mm -hmm. everyone knew the Jeep. The Jeep had obviously its war ties, but there was all these surplus Jeeps being sold to farmers, agriculture, miners, and recreationists in the U.S. And Utah had a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But the Land Cruiser wasn't quite a well-known name into the 60s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's, here's my question with the Land Cruiser, the actual name. Is that what they call it in Japan? Correct. Yeah, that is that's the trademark name. That like, is the yeah, trademark name. Is was, Land Cruiser. Yeah, that name was given to it. I, I, I'd have to check my facts on that one. I want to say 1955 or 19. That's really cool. Yeah, it was given the name Land Cruiser. Yeah, that is the name. It's not so. And see, what's really cool to me, what's really cool about that is that that is in Japan. That's a foreign. They don't mm -hmm. speak English, right? That's Correct, not yeah. there. And that's a really cool thing that that was the namesake that they chose for it. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's an interesting point. That how and why. A uh, Japanese company in Japan would use these, quote like technically like an English na an yeah, English yeah. word, but uh, the, there was the Crown, the Cressida, the Corolla. Yeah, there were a lot of other names that not necessarily English names, but like we would recognize them mm -hmm. and be able to read them. So that is an interesting point. But I I think that just speaks to the fact Toyota knew that this was going to be a global market for these, and yeah. and at that time <laughs> the U.S. kind of led the charge on automobile manufacturing. So if you were going to compete with these global Ford GM brands, you had to probably compete in the US, compete in that market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's talk about the, just cause we're still in these old Land Cruisers, we're in the, we're in the vintage world here. Was it always a straight six? Yeah, pr primarily, uh, everything we saw in the United States was a straight six. Right. All the way up until 1993, really, we had a straight six and a Land Cruiser. No kidding. Globally, there were four-cylinder diesels. There were you know other variants of the engines used, both four- and six-cylinder diesels. But the U.S. has always been an inline-six gas motor. In fact, actually, that same... It's an inline six, like F cast iron motor. That yeah. It was still an inline six all the way up until 1997. So the FZJ80 was an inline six. Mm -hmm. We didn't see anything different in the U.S. market until 1998 when the 100 series came out, which has a V8. Right. Everything before that was an inline six. It was an inline huh. six. Wow, amazing. So, and how long, when did they start throwing diesels for overseas marketing? Do you have any idea? Oh, really early on. Uh, certainly, uh, like known specimens in the early 70s, like okay. th th there were a yeah. B series diesel, like a single B series diesel. Four cylinder. Four cylinder, inline mm -hmm. four, yeah. Like a, they were non naturally aspirated, non turbo engines, pretty low horsepower, low output, but they were simple. They were torquey and they were efficient. Yeah. Okay. So in the, and, and here's the thing to be clear on Land Cruisers. I have, I don't own any Land Cruisers currently. I've actually, my per personally, I've never owned a Land Cruiser, but I always wanted one. <laughs> Let's just talk about some rage that I had <laughs> as a child, some pent up rage, right? Get it all my out. My first James. vehicle I wanted was a Land Cruiser. I begged my dad can I get a Land Cruiser, right? That's what I wanted. I wanted an FJ40. There's just something about them, the style, the view, their capabilities, which is kind of weird. They're very capable. I mean, it's like you're looking at that, and I was looking at that versus a Wrangler or mm -hmm. a CJ. Um, I, wouldn't, I didn't trust CJs just because of the mechanical. I just didn't trust it, right? You know what I mean? A lot of them were AMCs or whatever. I just didn't trust the mechanical of those. And Toyota's mechanical were just, it was solid, right? So that was part of it. Um, my dad was more of a looks man, right? So he's sitting there going, well, why don't you get this, right? Wranglers, <clears throat> like what, what could I have afforded back then? Like a, it would have been a 87, 89, or 88, 89 Wrangler. 
they had that 4.2 mm -hmm. with the plastic valve head cover mm -hmm. and they just kind of sucked. You know what I mean? History it's has like, said that wasn't like an amazing yeah, yeah. platform. It was like, that is not, and it's just like, so you're, and then that's the thing. It's like, so what am I comparing? I'm comparing leaf spring to leaf spring. Mm -hmm. I've got a solid drivetrain that seems to last forever. And I've got one that is not necessarily going to, that's also guaranteed weaker. The axles on the, you know, there is stuff about the Land Cruisers that, yeah, they've, they've got their weak points. Right. But I mean, Dana thirties and 35s, you know what I mean? They're just not the axle strength or anything like that. So anyway, um, begged my dad. He wouldn't buy me one. I ended up with a Nissan Pathfinder. Which, neat vehicle. Yeah. yeah neat they're vehicles, neat. Yeah, you know, yeah. was, it was okay. Quite capable for what they were. Exactly. Yeah. yeah but, and, and pretty reliable too, but yeah. not, not a, not a Land Cruiser. Then fast forward, um, <laughs> I don't know, maybe five years. And my little sister's like, I want a Land Cruiser. My dad just, first one he sees, dude. First one he shows, oh, dude, man. he buys one up for her. And I'm like, dude, what in the hell? And it had a V8, right? And I'm like, no, no, you don't, we don't want to go this route. Um, it was kind of a piece of crap. And she was all mad about it and everything like that. She was upset. It broke mm. quite often and everything like that because that V8, right? I think we cracked a transfer case. Mm. Um, Known issue. Then, uh, you know, Jed Clark, remember Jed? I do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Jed had that, I guess it was kind of turquoise. Okay. It was turquoise. It was turquoise. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he had that turquoise Land Cruiser that he'd, put, he'd just dumped so much money, or his dad dumped so much money. One of the two did, probably both of them anyway. Um, and he put that up for sale, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's it's all right. It's it's pretty good, right? And my dad just Snapped. bought it right out for man. And I'll tell you what, <laughs> I can't tell you how pissed off I was <laughs> about he would just buy her whatever Land Cruiser she wanted, and then I got to work on him, and I did not want to work on him. And anyway. I'm with Sarah. We need so, to air this out, James. This <laughs> yeah, is obviously yeah. a, Dude, some it, aggression in there. I, I was, can see it I was out. pretty frustrated. Yeah. Can you believe I made that guy my business partner? <laughs> Seriously. It's so crazy. anyway, well, that that speaks really well for your temperament and your ability to forgive that yeah. you, you got past this. There you I, go. Well, I appreciate you, yeah. there you go. telling me that. So yeah, sorry to get off on that tangent. All and stuff good. Like, all but good. I, this is the, good to know. The '40s were just. They had this look. They had this style. They had this. They were just absolutely beautiful. I mean, my dream FJ40 would be the one that Adam Tolman had. Mm -hmm. The money pit. Oh man, beautiful. Cruiser. That thing was so beautiful, and I still can't believe that I actually sold it. Kind of shocks me. Yeah, yeah. A little bit, because it was. That was like an '83, wasn't it? And it was. I think it was quite that new. It was, was a it late, late, uh, late 70s, maybe was like it? a 78. Yeah, if okay. I'm remembering correctly. It's still around. It pops up every once in a while, like photos of it. Somebody's still got Does it. it? They're, they're using it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, just recently, like within the last six months, and it hadn't been seen for, or I hadn't seen it. And I don't think Adam had either for about five, six years. And a guy popped online that had just picked it up and huh. actually tagged Adam. Like, holy cow, there's the oh. old money pit. It's back oh, at man. it. This guy just, he was trailing it to go <laughs> kind of clean it up. And it had been parked, looked like it had been parked for a while, but still a beautiful cruiser. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great cruiser. So that's the, let's get into the oh. kind of nomenclature side of what the cruiser is. I know this it might be boring to some people, but if it is boring to you, then that's your problem. Yeah, if you need a bathroom break, because now's a perfect time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But we're going to go into this either way. We need to. We got to, we got to nail it down. So, what was the so fj40 right let's get into what the f okay so the way land cruisers always work is yeah. that there's going to be a letter and or two letters before a j every land cruiser has a j in their model code mm -hmm. so if you ever <coughs> are looking at whether this is a land cruiser or not it's usually pretty easy by looking at toyota's given model code but that model mm -hmm. code is also going to have as i mentioned a letter or two before the the J, and that is going to denote what engine it has. So an okay. FJ40 means it's an F series, F powered one. Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier they used that F all the way up until like 1992, mm -hmm. and then it became an FZJ, and in that case okay. it has a one FZ motor. So there's there's that won't necessarily tell you exactly which engine it is, but it'll tell you which series of engines, which family of engines. Mm -hmm. So you could also have a BJ40, right? And that would be a B series diesel. Or you could have an HJ60, that would be an H series diesel, 60 series. Mm -hmm. So those little letters before tell you what engine series it has. And then you have the numbers after. And you can have a 40, which would be a 40 series, of course. Right. But you can also have a 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, and 47. Really? Those I are had all no idea there were so many. There are that many. It's crazy. <clears throat> and that is going to tell you other packages such as a troop carrier. Right. A truck, a mm -hmm. wagon, a medium wheelbase short wheelbase, long wheelbase. So that code is going to denote the, the, that sub-series, we would call that, of a 40 series. They're all collectively a 40 series, but 
an HJ47 is also a 40 series. So it gets a little confusing, it's it oh. a little foggy. Yeah. But those are all sub series within the series. So like an HJ47 is a troop carrier, okay. or it could be a pickup truck, mm -hmm. uh, that longer wheelbase, and that's got an H power diesel, mm -hmm. but it is a Land Cruiser. Or there's a BJ42, which is like a little, uh, we never got them in the US, but that's gonna have the B series diesel 40 series. Okay. Or there's 45s that are trucks. So there's, Toyota was a solution provider in those years, and certainly still is to this date with their Land Cruiser. You can always get yeah. a truck, still mm -hmm. to this day, and they started with that in the early days. You, you can, can get still a wagon. get a Land Cruiser truck? Not in the right U.S., now? but globally, absolutely. Globally, yeah. you still yeah. can. They, it, both oh. a two-door and a four-door pickup truck. They're manufacturing truck. them still? You bet. Absolutely. No kidding. Yeah, the 70 series is still made as a 79 in a single I, cab I double cab. I thought that all got... Nope. Still made. Still, still made. Still sold. Series. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, you can still buy a brand new 70 series in some mm. markets. Not the U.S. Right. So we moved from the, the, the 40 series, so that's that sub-series. So you've got the, the first number is going to be like the holistic series or the, the global series, and then the second number is going to be the sub-series. Okay. So then you have the 40 series, the 50 series, and it, truthfully, it started before that. We have the 20 series, the 30 series, which are extremely rare. Wow. 20s yeah, are rare yeah. in their own right. Mm -hmm. 40s, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, mm -hmm. and we skipped 110s. Maybe Land Rover had taken that one up or whatever, <laughs> so we go to 120. And then 150. There's a 120 and a yeah, 150. Yeah, a 120. There's a, a like a Land is that Cruiser like one. Prado? It's a Prado. It's a Prado. And wow. a 120 in yeah. the U.S. is a GX 470. Yep. Oh, a 150 okay. series Land Cruiser it is Prado. It's a 460. Mm -hmm. You got it. And then they go to the 200 series, and now we're just starting to see the 300 series on the global market. Mm -hmm. We're not going to see that uh, immediately, but uh, you know, it'll be a long time before we see those stateside. But, Do you uh, think we will see 300 series? It's like I heard they weren't going to, it wasn't going to happen. We're not going to see it initially. That's for sure. My, my guess is like anybody's, I, I uh, you hear lots of different rumors and stories and ideals, yeah. but what we know is it's not coming in 2022 to the United States. Okay. But you're thinking eventually it will. Uh, I think at some point we'll see something back. I don't know why it wouldn't. I mean, they still sell them. They're not moving a ton. I mean, what is there, 1,200 per Certainly there were There about? were years as few as 1,200 of okay. the Land Cruiser okay. proper. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind that in the U.S., since the LX450 and 80 series in the right. 90s, they've had two parallel models. Mm -hmm. They're nearly identical uh, drivetrain-wise and mm -hmm. frame-wise, chassis-wise, They're but a, a Toyota version and a Lexus version. So we had the, mm -hmm. the 80 slash 450, the 100 470, the 200 570, and now we have the 300 and the yet-to-be-named Lexus that we likely will see here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. yeah. as a Lexus. Mm -hmm. So we'll still get that Land Cruiser chassis, It'll just be trimmed as a Lexus model, which usually means a little different fascia, mm -hmm. different interior, usually a little more plush uh, amenities inside and outside. Mm -hmm. Now the trooper, troop carriers, uh -huh. AKA troopies, is that what Martin's mm -hmm. always talking about? Troopies, mm -hmm. you bet. Mm -hmm. Longer wheelbase, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that have the jump seats. They yeah. do. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. They okay. can, yeah. They Traditionally, globally, they'll have a jump seat package. So instead of having bench seats or forward facing seats, they would have side-by-side -side seats. So they get the name Troopy because they were like troop carriers. So they're made to just haul a lot of people. They had a, what we would call ambulance doors or kind of side-by-side -side barn doors on the back. So mm -hmm. you can like exit and enter from the back. Okay. They did make Troopies with bench seats as well. So just depend on the market oh, and the package. Okay. But most traditionally would be a Troopy with like rows of the jump seats down both sides. Now, are you still bringing Land Cruisers in? So uh, Steve does at Land mm -hmm. Cruisers Direct. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Steve's, uh, that's, that's his business, and he absolutely still does that. Steve and I partner on a lot of uh, you know, business projects and mm -hmm. some of those vehicles, and he's definitely still bringing them over. And that's okay. been one of those shot in the arms. We talked earlier on that, like, if you would ask me 25 years ago what the shelf life, or say 20 years ago, what the shelf life of Land Cruiser market in the U.S. was, mm -hmm. I would have said, like, at some point they've got to get less popular. But with all the different factors that have happened and the popularity of vintage 4x4s, but one big thing that's happened is once vehicles are 25 years old globally, mm -hmm. those non-U.S. Land Cruisers can come to the United States. And that's not just Land Cruisers. You see a lot of people bringing Defenders and Land right. Rovers over, Land Rovers. Mm -hmm. Nissans, mm -hmm. Patrols, like all these cool 4x4 platforms that we never saw in the U.S. are now able to come over legally mm -hmm. once they're 25 years old. Right. And that's been mm -hmm. a huge shot in the arm in the Land Cruiser community because we never saw the 70 Series in the United States. Canada had a really small window of them in like 1985 and it was a we're yeah. talking like several 500 of them came mm -hmm. um, but now they've made the 70 series from 1985 through current and that's kind of like the replacement of the 40 series you can still get a removable top two-door four-door short wheelbase yeah all these cool variants front rear locking differentials factory winches 
that model was never brought to the United States. Instead, we had the 60, the 80 series, kind of the more uh, wagon human hauler platforms, like more luxury wagons, mm -hmm. just more appropriate for the buyer in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, but those 70s are cool. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of those coming over the United States now. Yeah, very cool. that's very cool. Yeah. Can we, I, can we talk about FJ cruisers and... Were yeah, they? yeah. Because the, I know, the bastard I know this child is a, of Land I was, Cruisers. I wasn't going to say it, but you did. <laughs> Your yeah, word's dude. not mine. Dude, because I'm, you talk I, about increasing popularity mm -hmm. over time, and I'm like, it's been interesting for us to just see the FJ folks and, and our, our sales of yeah. those products just, you know, they're super strong, and it's, it's, a, it's a cool market. It is a cool market. The, the, this is what I've watched, this is, I, I use the words, right? But I don't care. Somebody can criticize me. I don't care. But here's what it is, dude. <laughs> when I started producing product, like when I saw that come in, I think I saw the blue one. They had it seam it, mm -hmm. had the, the ARB yeah. from the Prado on and everything like that. Um, I mean, it mostly fit. It mostly worked. It looked, it looked cool. Right. And I remember we like climbed into it and everything like that. And it was, this was like SEMA 2005, I believe. Right. Um, and I hadn't planned to make bumpers for it, right? Right at that time, it was just the only thing I was doing was the Jeep TJ. And I was just planning for the four-door Wrangler. I knew it was coming. It was coming, yeah. You know, so I was just planning. And I knew it was going to be a big hit. So um, I wasn't really thinking much on him. But then I, I forget his name. I want to say his name's Steve, but I forget his name. He was somewhere in uh, Springville area. A guy got one and it was blue, Voodoo right? Blue. Voodoo blue. Mm -hmm. And um, Cameron was like, hey, you know, you should you should really look at these. These are pretty cool. Maybe you should build a bumper for it. Right. And I'm like, oh, OK, I'm open to it. Right. And he was he was cool donating his vehicle. And I had no idea what the market was going to be. But I mean, I I designed the bumper on I Hate Mud. I got on I Hate Mud and I was showing the bump, showing my designs and everything like that and catting it up and everything like that. And um it was crazy because what it seemed to me is like there was this group of people that were, this is not a Land Cruiser. Don't ever call it a Land Cruiser. <laughs> it's an FJ Cruiser. It's not the same thing. And they were adamant, like, you know what I mean? Oh, it was that like, exists to this wow. day. Yeah. Yeah. Does it? And I'm like, I'm like, dude, okay, I get it. You know, it, it very similar chassis as the Prado, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not the FJ 40 that we all, you know what I mean? Everyone totally. was like, we all wanted an FJ40, a modern FJ40. Right. We basically wanted a BJ70. Right. That's what we all wanted, right? right? We yeah, wanted a 70 little, series. little removable top. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. heavy that's, duty chassis. That's what we were all hoping it was. And it wasn't quite that, but I mean, it's got this crazy cult following. People mm -hmm. just love those. And uh, it's still one of our one of our top sellers. Yeah. Is and that right? Crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's and as wild. The way I understood it, that Kurt explained the part numbers there and the that FJ does mean Land Cruiser. Do I understand that right? It does have a GRJ, it's, it's so it'd be technically it'd be a Land Cruiser Prado. Like okay. it'd be like a chassis wise, it's a Land Cruiser Prado. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is that is true. Uh, that that contention will happen and will live <laughs> on longer than us. I predict. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that 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 pontificating, if we can call it that, happens even from the four guys. This is happening a ton right this minute because the new 300 series is coming out on a global level. Mm -hmm. And everybody, history always has a way of kind of deciding that the last model was the best model. And the new model <laughs> really? is no longer a Land Cruiser. Like they've ruined that, that's ruined. <laughs> Despite the fact that the 300 we're seeing like with factory front and rear locking differentials, like things mm -hmm. Land Cruiser hasn't had in the, particularly in any IFS chassis ever. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing some really neat things about it, but Land Cruiser owners always have a way of saying like, they've ruined it, it's done, it's broken. <laughs> the 200's the last best one. And that happened when the FJ Cruiser came out, but they were like a, maybe a bigger target because now you had every Land Cruiser owner across the board where like they could finally unite about one thing. They were no longer fighting about which series was the best. Now yeah. it's that the FJ Cruiser is not a Land Cruiser. Like, <laughs> if Toyota wanted to be a Land Cruiser, it would have set it right there on the side like right that's where they put it you know like yeah. it doesn't say that uh i don't really get too deep in the whole argument of that because it just doesn't matter we sell a lot of fj cruiser parts yeah um there is one at the land cruiser museum in salt lake we got like a zero mile fj cruiser it's wow. got five miles on it but it's never Sweet. been dealer prep because it is part of the cruiser story mm -hmm. holistically it's part of the heritage and it's, I think. exactly it's part yeah. of the heritage and, and it certainly was made to look at it had some styling cues of an old fj40 the bezel the screen the mm -hmm. two the, the, the uh, white top 
Uh, so it would be naive at best to say that like Toyota wasn't looking at the FJ40 when they designed the FJ Cruiser. We know that happened. Mm -hmm. We've got some other examples down in the museum that'll kind of help piece that story together. So we need to get you, maybe go do a podcast from there one day. That'd yeah. be sweet. And talk about the museum. I'd love to do that. And I should back up real quick and just say, I'm fortunate to be on the board of directors for the Land Cruiser Museum in Salt Lake. We've got mm -hmm. a little over 100 vehicles there that uh, have been put together by uh, visionary, uh, you know, Greg Miller put that together years ago mm -hmm. and has kind of turned it into a, it's now a nonprofit to collect and preserve the history of the Land Cruiser. So it's a great place to come learn the Land Cruiser story. Mm -hmm. I can tell it to you here, but like if we, if we go look at it in person, you can see the 40, the 41, the 42, it really yeah. kind yeah. of makes it all sense. But, but back to the FJ Cruiser, what it did do, um, we can, we can fight about the name, fight about what it is, what it isn't, but what it did do is brought a lot of people to the Toyota lineup. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. as a as a project and as a vehicle and as a platform, it's a great great vehicle. You've seen them do all sorts oh, of amazing yeah. trails. People have driven them all over. They're still sold new. You can still buy an FJ Cruiser. Not can you realize Saudi Arabia? Really? Yeah, we, yeah, we were over in Saudi last year for the Dakar Rally, and FJ Cruisers at dealerships there. They still sell and make oh, new wow. FJ Cruisers. That is really cool. They're still made. They're still popular there. They have the same GRJ, that one GR mm -hmm. engine, and still the V640. It's a great motor. Solid motor. Solid motor. Yeah. We still see it in the Forerunner. It's a, I mean, a fantastic platform. But uh, in the U.S., it brought so many people to the Toyota lineup. They were maybe previously Jeep owners. Maybe they were previously never had had a 4x4. Mm -hmm. Maybe they were looking at an Xterra, but they said, hey, this FJ Cruiser looks cool. It's capable. The Trail Team's launch is proving what it can do in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of cool accessories coming out with them, like neat bumpers, neat options. I can build this thing. Yeah. And they became lifelong Toyota owners. They, mm. So when the FJ Cruiser got a little older, it was discontinued in the U.S., they bought 4Runners. They bought 5th Gen 4Runners. They yeah. bought mm -hmm. Land Cruisers. They bought Tundras, Tacomas. So Lexus GX. Lexus GX is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think as a project and as a, as a vehicle platform, it was a home run for Toyota. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know that they designed it. I think people were upset when it got discontinued and thought like, hey, where's the next version of the FJ Cruiser? Yeah. This is my personal opinion. Just be real clear on that. I don't think they ever designed it to have a follow-up. I think no, it was designed I don't to be, think they did either. let's bring people to Toyota. Let's build this exciting, fun vehicle and let's capture them as customers and make them Toyota fans. And, mm -hmm. th and it worked. And these are lifelong Toyota fans that started in FJ Cruisers. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I think it's a great vehicle. It's a, I've spent a lot of time on trails with friends still to this day that, that off-road with them and customers and uh, some of the, the training and, and trips we do. They're great. I never worry about the FJ Cruiser. It's, just, it's a great platform. Yeah. yeah. The FJ Summit event in Uray, Colorado. Oh, yeah. This is one amazing. of my favorite mm -hmm. events Love that, event. that we do. Yep. And it's yeah, super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Lots. I mean, there's a lot more Toyota showing up now. I think there's a lot more forerunners and some Jeeps sneak in there, mm -hmm. even though people have mixed feelings about that. But um, <laughs> I think I think the, the FJ Cruiser people are a little bit more open to yeah. the occasional Jeep person. Yeah, yeah. a little yeah. bit. Yeah, but it's so. such a fun event and such a cool and very capable, obviously, because yeah. we're doing some some pretty good trails so yeah yeah it's a, I, i've been fortunate to make it to fj summit a few times over the years it is that's a fantastic event and goes to show just how passionate that user group became yes. early yes. on yeah. yeah like land cruiser guys are that way too but maybe a little standoffish too <laughs> about you know, like about it but fj cruiser guys it was it's a neat event and you're right there's a lot of forerunners a lot of land cruisers tacomas mm -hmm. other yeah. mostly toyota a lot of lexuses are there these days yeah mm -hmm. that's a cool event and they've done a great job with that over the years really but, but that's all driven by that passion that the fj cruiser inspired in people about Hey, let's get together and do, go do some cool things in these vehicles. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's other there's one other Land Cruiser that I've been thinking about that I actually this is the curiosity because we all know, I said it, FG Cruiser is kind of the bastard child of the Land Cruiser, right? But there's a different cruiser that doesn't have that FJ, and it's the Mega Cruiser. And so that's the big question: is how do people feel about that? Well. What's the story on that? Because the you know, Mega Cruiser's pretty bad A. They're they're cool. Dude, they're, they're cool. You have one, don't you? I do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've cool. made me want to get one. Actually, after I saw yours, I was like, I would want to get this over a Hummer. That's because, fair. But so, I'd want one that wasn't a military one. You get which a civilian they're version. Super hard to find. Hard to find. They yeah. only made yeah less than two hundred of them in the civilian version. Mm. Man. So the Mega Cruiser, I would go back to the exact same argument that I, I don't care whether it's a Land Cruiser or not. Like it doesn't yeah. personally change my life. I love it. It's a neat vehicle for what it is. Yeah. It doesn't say Land Cruiser anywhere on the side of it. So I'm it not going to like. It says Mega it Cruiser. It says Mega Cruiser. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not going to make any, uh, you know, try to 
win any arguments <laughs> that it's a Land Cruiser because, well, they just didn't write that on there. The model code doesn't say it. The mm -hmm. name doesn't say it. What it is is a really neat vehicle, and it's a cruiser. So as a cruiser lover, I can it's love it. It's a cruiser lover. I don't just yeah, have to be yeah. a Land Cruiser okay. lover. I can love all cruisers. It's a cruiser. Yeah, I'm a cruiser. Okay. I'm a cruiser okay. head. So the Mega Cruiser is Japan's answer to a... Uh, essentially what the Humvee was designed to do for the United States military and our partner nations is it's their light mobility vehicle to a troop carrier. can mm -hmm. also have a gun mount, tow a trailer, radar, etc. A lot of people look at it as like a knockoff of a Humvee. Mm. Yeah, I get You can that, see the design similarities, yeah. but you also have to remember we're a partner nation with Japan. Yeah, we train we with Japan. We go into battle with, with Japanese do. soldiers. They have our jets. We have bases over there. You bet. We, I mean, we trade a lot of technology back yeah. and forth. The Humvee was certainly designed by the U.S. military, but that was like kind of parameters they gave that vehicle. It needs to fit this size, this cube, haul this load, this payload, this engine, this speed. Yeah. Japan did the same thing with the Mega Cruiser and said, this is what it's got to kind of be. This is what our counterparts are using. We want to have something similar. So uh, I've got some amazing photos of a uh, U.S. landing craft, like a big hovercraft with mm -hmm. mega cruisers and Humvees both on the really? decks. Like, oh, that is they don't so look cool. at them as knockoffs; they look at them as counterparts. Yeah, that's what our Japanese military <laughs> counterparts use. Yeah. This is what we use. Yeah, uh, they they're really neat vehicles. They feature a, oddly, despite how big they are, it's a four-cylinder turbo diesel, and you'd kind of think like, oh, wow. man, the thing's got to be kind of anemic, but they actually move just fine. Yeah. They're not designed, though, chassis-wise and weight-wise to be as up-armored as maybe a Humvee was. Right. So you're not going to see them with, like, full ballistic packages like you would a Humvee. Mm -hmm. But you definitely see them loaded up, hauling a trailer, military convoy use. And they're still in use by the Japanese military to this day. The ones we're getting over to the United States are surplus models. Mm -hmm. And they're just now hitting that 25-year age. So they're right. mid-90s models. But they're cool. Four-wheel steering, locking differentials front wow. and rear. Really yeah. neat packages. Yeah, uh, portal reduction hubs front and rear. Mm -hmm. So they're cool. Hmm. Yeah. How much How much are those running? If somebody was going to bring, so you guys bring them in, maybe on occasion you're able to grab one. What do you guys sell those for? They're like in the thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 range. Really? Okay. Yeah, which actually isn't bad not considering bad. what they are and how much they do. I yeah. mean, they're like the ultimate like sag wagon for an adventure. Like say you're supporting a giant group of mountain bikers all the time or something. It's like a perfect vehicle for that. You can put like a four foot wide by 10 foot long, like sheet of plywood of such a thing mm -hmm. a need existed <laughs> for such a thing fits like flat in the back of the vehicle. Mm. I mean, like that's how much, how big the deck platform mm -hmm. is. It's a perfectly flat bottom because it's portal reduction hubs and it's IFS IRS it has mm -hmm. so much ground clearance, but all the drivetrains tucked up underneath the body. So there's no like necessarily like trans tunnel. It's like all yeah. one tunnel down through the middle. So it can haul an amazing amount of like gear and personnel. 10 people in seatbelts can oh, fit wow. in that thing. So it's, they're, wow. they're pretty cool troop carriers. That is very cool. So yeah, for the money and what, you know, you're getting a turbo diesel, portal reduction, mm -hmm. locking disc front and rear, four-wheel steering. They're really cool vehicles for that kind of money. But I acknowledge it's a very small uh, collection of people that would ever want to have something that weird. I'll include myself in that. Mm -hmm. And that's why Steve from Land Cruiser Direct and myself, we bought a couple of them as a little project to have mm -hmm. them. They're, they're cool. Oh. They're unique. Yours is soft top, right? Correct. Military now, version. Do they have, are all the military versions soft top? Yes. Yeah, so I've never, it's possible there's some out there in Japan or different packages mm -hmm. that had a hard, hard top, top, but not that we've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. They're either a soft top troop carrier. There are some soft top uh, cab models and hard top cab models. Yeah. And then of course the civilian version is like a full cab. Okay. Mm -hmm. Both right. in a, a standard roof height and like kind of a high roof that had like a oh, pitched up roof. Okay. Yeah, that was available in the civilian version as well. But like you said, on the civilian version, they only made 200. It's like I, I, the numbers on pretty, my time, I want to say like numbers. 184 or 164. It's a really small yeah. number that they ever made. And they basically, that was, they had the military ones first. And, and this is my mind how it plays out is, is people in Japan or maybe even Toyota executives were saying like, hey, I want one of those, but it's got to be a civilian version. Yeah. So they basically took the military one and added a top and doors. It's pretty rudimentary construction. Like it's quality construction, but you can tell it was like, it's a, it's got a door on it. And now it's got like a little piece of panel on there and the carpet is pretty low key. It's like, it wasn't mm -hmm. a fully refined. It's not the land cruiser interior you think of if you were to climb in the civilian version, right. it's the military version with a, a cab and windows on it. It's oh, still cool. pretty uh, robust and, and rudimentary uh, yeah. feature wise. Design. Yeah. 
It's not not a creature comfort vehicle no, per no. se. No, this isn't this isn't a typical Land Cruiser with leather yeah. heated seats and air. You know, it mm-hmm. does have air conditioning in that civilian model, but it's like a standalone AC unit that sits like in the <laughs> middle. <laughs> it is plumbed in. It kind of looks like it was uh, fit there, but you can certainly see like, hey, we've got this. Now we got to put AC in it. Like, boom, we're gonna mount it right on yeah. top of. You know, it's not huh. wasn't designed into the dash. I wonder if you could. I wonder if you could. Uh, and I know a lot of people are doing this with Hummers now. Is they're they're buying up the military surplus and they're cleaning them up you know mm-hmm. what i mean making them a little bit more creature comfort i haven't i haven't seen i haven't looked really hard either but i haven't seen anybody do anything that's like amazing interior wise but i just wonder what that would what that would run you to do that on a mega cruiser yeah people have done that actually there's a shop in colorado uh profits cruisers his profits kind of built, has? he's I've built kind of done some cleanup on them and built okay. some for tour vehicles so did like some, really okay uh, like even bench style seats like some of the humvees you see in moab yeah. that are made to just kind of haul tourists and do some little off-road trails yeah the problem with I've, i too have seen the, the many companies doing that with humvees there's one down in utah county uh mm-hmm. they pop up at some of the off-road shows here locally that have been doing those the problem with the mega cruiser is, is availability there's a very low number there's very few there's exactly as of today like 18 of them in the united states so wow. we're not talking like enough of them to make a a business around right and even if you tried they're not exactly super prevalent in japan right they i mean they're prevalent with their military but they don't surplus a lot and when they do get surplus, there's a lot of those going to mm. Russia, oh, uh, okay. Europe. There's mm-hmm. there's some buyers that really love them in some of those locations that are like bidding for those. So they don't sell super inexpensive enough that you could maybe make a business around mm-hmm. just mega cruisers. So yeah, I would just end that with if you're looking for a mega cruiser, you probably just buy the first one you find because there's not many of them to choose yeah. from. So mm-hmm. you know, for that limited collection of people that mm-hmm. want a mega cruiser, you just buy the one you can get your hands on. Yeah, mm-hmm. towards the end of the year, I was looking for trucks to buy i ended up buying this thing right beautiful so truck we're gonna build this thing up and it's gonna you know we haven't developed product for this so we're gonna be doing it this is a gmc if anyone's wondering what's next to me beautiful it's a GMC denali. denali yeah and so that's the thing is a hundred thousand dollars i saw i'm skipping ahead in my mind sorry the uh i, I found a mega cruiser mm-hmm. the problem was it it had sold already, but I found one in, I think it was in Kazakhstan. I know who bought it. And it was a, you do? <laughs> it's coming to Denver, yeah. I know Is exactly it really? Who bought it. Yeah, I know wow. exactly who bought it. Yeah, I mean, and it was like, I think the price tag was over a hundred grand or something yeah. like that. And then I was, then you got to ship it from there to Kazakhstan. And I was like, ooh, that would be a cool one to have. You yeah, know what a, I mean? It was a civilian version. And uh, yeah, a friend in Colorado bought that. He's got to sit on it for a little while before it's U.S. legal import. Okay. It said 95 on the paperwork, but as I or said, maybe right. it was 96 on the paperwork, but if you ran the actual VIN number, it was a 97. Yeah. So whatever, I can't remember the exact dates, but it's got to kind of, it's it's just a minute before it can get imported to the U.S. because they're pretty strict about that 25 right. years mm-hmm. from date of production. And mm-hmm. as we know, manufacturers sometimes build something in September of 2001, but they call the 2002. So there's just a, it has a little bit of weight before that one can come over, but that will be in the United States uh, soon. And that will be Mega Cruiser civilian number two that is in the United States. Wow. One's in the museum in Salt Lake. And, 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 and yeah, Chase one. will have number two. Mm, lucky man. Yeah. Lucky man. There's been some others. Toyota brought one over. They actually had one the year they launched the FJ Cruiser. They had a, a Mega Cruiser at SEMA that year. Did they? Yeah, okay. there was a Mega Cruiser. Oh, yes, there was. was. That's correct. Yeah, but I that one that. that one was re-exported. Oh, bummer. Oh. Mm-hmm. Man. Well, if one pops up, okay. I'll let, let me you know. know. I'll let you know. Because I, I seriously, that's I, I would get one of those. Just they're so they're very unique. They're very rare. I'm pretty sure that one that was at SEMA, I remember you saying that now I got a good look in the inside. And yeah, they're they're pretty they're pretty raw. Yeah. But I mean and the, the other part, part is like, okay, so you get a military version and then how much is that going to run you to throw everything else you want in there to make it? I mean, it would be a fun project because the truth of it is, I think it'd be a hell of a fun project to actually build, build it out how you want to and make an interior and stuff like that. But for a man like me, there's no time, right? unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Got to be so, realistic with your time. Yeah. No, we had, a, I, I definitely wanted to talk about that thing because the Mega Cruiser, that's that other, mm-hmm. like you have the FG Cruiser and the Mega Cruiser. Those mm-hmm. are those two kind of weird yeah, ones. There's, but there's actually a few others. There's what's called there? a, a, a Mini Cruiser, like a Delta Mini Cruiser. Oh. And there were like these, uh, there also were uh, Blizzards, Toyota Blizzards, and they were built like on a Daihatsu uh, Wildcat, which really? is like the size of a... Uh, samurai maybe yeah. even a, a huh. little bit smaller samurai but they also have like a bezel and they have like the fj40 really? turn oh, signals i think i've seen these they have the, yeah. like the white top so it, it's certainly not uh, the first time the fj cruiser wasn't the first time that the land cruisers or, or the 40 series is like kind of 
patented looks, if you will, that bezel, that roof, mm -hmm. that two-tone was used on other models. Yeah. yeah. And and there's this these mini cruisers are a funny story because they were they were built to look like a, a Land Cruiser, but they or an FJ40, but uh -huh. really didn't share much DNA at all. And there is one of those in the museum too, because it is part of that whole story. It's part mm -hmm. of the whole. Uh, what years were those produced? Oh, uh, I don't know a ton about uh, wild or mini cruisers, just because they're not like they're built by this company called Delta in the Philippines. They're not super. Is this more modern though? No, oh, like 80s, like 90s. 80s, 90s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, certainly in the 80s, but they're very hand built. They like all of them are a little different because they were kind of building these on chassis of other okay. vehicles. Um, but they, th that's just part of that. And in a lot of places around the world, Land Cruisers are, a, and, I, and to be fair, the U.S. too, it's a status symbol, like a, a new Land Cruiser, maybe for a traditional new Land Cruiser buyer outside of like the Land Cruiser community, but some people buy a Land Cruiser as a status symbol. It's why you spend $100,000 mm -hmm. on a new car. I mean, no different than a Denali. It's like kind of you buy like the, the, tr the high trim level vehicle. And that's, mm -hmm. that's even definitely the case in uh, places where Land Cruisers are very prevalent, Central America, South America. So these well, Delta Mini Cruisers kind of like look like a Land Cruiser, but they mm -hmm. at a much lower price point. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Well, and, and you just kind of jumped into the South America part of it. Isn't there still a manufacturer that's manufacturing, it's not a Land Cruiser, but it's basically pretty close to a Land Cruiser. They did. They no longer do. That you're they, thinking of Bondurante. Bondurante. Yeah, and they were yeah. made in Brazil market so that's, only. They're gone now. Yeah, they're no longer building the that the, the Bondurantes, and they uh, really neat, interesting kind of story. The way that played out is that they, yeah, they were building under license from Toyota, able to build mm -hmm. those with that Land Cruiser 40 series look into the 2000s. So you could wow. get these four door yeah. Land Cruiser 40 series looking pickup trucks. They actually. They use the name OJ as their like model code. Mm, so like an OJ okay. 55 LB huh. could be like a long bed pickup mm -hmm. truck. Um, yeah. So again, not a Land Cruiser, though. Those <laughs> ones actually said Land Cruiser on them. They Did were they using, really yes, totally. They were using Land Cruiser emblems and Toyota <laughs> emblems. And, and they're very yeah. similar. But if you put the two side by side, you'll see that the sheet metal is a little different mm -hmm. in some areas. But they're, they're really neat. And if you're a collector of them, that's awesome. They're cool vehicles. And there's a lot of those coming over the U.S. right now because they're hitting those 25 year old marks. Mm. And you can find land cruisers that never existed in the u.s such as a four-door truck land cruiser right. truck never existed here so people are ripe to want to import and get those huh. now can we talk about the land cruiser achilles heels because mm, sure. they're they're out there they're out there yeah yeah <laughs> they exist yeah. it's a real thing so for example one thing that i know about is um let's talk about the burfield mm -hmm. now it's not now here's the thing burfields are actually pretty cool joint in my opinion the engineering behind that concept mm -hmm. it's it's way better in many cases than a u uh, joint right yeah it doesn't change speeds it yeah. rotates and yeah yeah and constant velocity but for some reason those suckers just break yeah it's a yeah, where do you start on burfield so burfield started in land cruisers in uh, 1967, 68. Mm -hmm. Before that, they had what's called a ball and claw. And it's a really interesting one too. If you've never seen one, it's actually two yokes, opposing yokes okay. that look a lot like U-joint yokes. But mm -hmm. instead of a U-joint in there, it had this big bronze ball oh, with wow. grooves around it in both directions. So that ball <laughs> became the joint as it moved. Really? It's really neat. It's called a ball and claw front axle. Wow. So Toyota went to the what's called the Burfield. Our Zeppa joint's got a lot of different names in the industry, mm -hmm. which for those that don't know what a Burfield is, if you know what a CV is, it's basically the exact same thing that like mm -hmm. a CV axle is, but just think of one half of the joint, but then no boot. It runs open because it's inside of a knuckle that's encapsulated in grease, so it doesn't require a boot. Mm -hmm. So the Burfield, those early model Burfields that were, that we call them like a coarse spline Burfield, 1968 up to like 1975, they mm -hmm. were, they're not strong. They were great for a Land Cruiser that came with factory 31s and open differentials. You mm -hmm. start putting 33s and 35s and a locking diff, and they're a, mm. they're a grenade. They will break. Mm. <laughs> so that is an Achilles heel of a Land Cruiser, and you yeah. have to be reasonable that that is a weak link. Now, there is there is companies that are making ultra beefy versions of that. Like, Absolutely. Right? So it's really a non-issue in modern times, and that's even changed mm -hmm. a lot in the 15, 20 years, which is remarkable because this is something that started in Land Cruisers in 1968, but even in the last 10, 15 years, now that problem's 100% solved. It kind of took a long time. Mm -hmm. People were still like carrying a stock Toyota Burfield like that they got at the wrecking yard as their trail spare even right. 10 years ago, 15 yeah. years ago. Now, and, and they had value, like a used Burfield could be worth $100 out of like an old Land Cruiser. Mm -hmm. Now there's not a whole lot of value because now there's all <laughs> these Cromali 300M, you've got Nitro, RCV, Trail Gear, et cetera, mm -hmm. building heavy duty Burfield kits, mm -hmm. both inners and outers. Guys are running King of the Hammers 
um, 35s, 37s, zero issues. Yeah. 80 series guys running 40s, no issues. So the, the, the problem solved, but you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. In a stock traditional setup, that got better as we got into disc brakes. The Burfields got fine spline. Right. And then by the time we got to the 80 series, they got a lot bigger. They mm -hmm. still break a stock one, but they, got, they continuously improved and got better. But certainly if you've ever been on the trail with a group of land cruisers or a lot of trail time, you've seen somebody break a berf. Yeah. Mm -hmm. RCV, right? RCV. Yeah, that's yep. what I'm, I'm pretty sure. I've got a Jeep behind me that has RCVs. Yeah. You know what I mean? No more yeah. U-joint No more U-joint. You know what it's, I mean? It's a burr so filled. It's a burr filled joint. In this case, it's Jeep. open. They put a boot on it. Yeah. 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 I, can see, I can see the orange boot on mm -hmm. it from here. Those are yeah. definitely RCVs. It's pretty cool, huh? And their RCV is kind of like a top shelf burr filled manufacturer. They do a 300M model. Mm -hmm. They do a Cromali 4340 and 300M, and that's pretty indestructible. Yeah. Hmm. Did, um, just out of curiosity, did the Orion transfer case ever happen? Did that ever happen? 100%. We still sell yeah. them to this you day. You still sell them? Yeah. So the Orion was a project by Advanced Adapters to get mm -hmm. rid of that we another known weak link, yeah. which was the one-piece T-cases that featured, that, that Land Cruisers featured all the way up until 1980. Mm -hmm. And we call it one-piece just because it can be uh, completely divorced from the, the transmission in one piece. You don't have to, like, disassemble the T-case. Later mm -hmm. models, you did. Later Land Cruiser models. So those were an aluminum housing. There were quite a few different renditions with different amount of ribbing, but they could particularly heavy off-road use, never in stock applications, but heavy off-road use mm -hmm. and almost always happened or when it happened behind V8s mm -hmm. would crack the case into two pieces, just split yeah. right down the middle. Yeah. So guys came up with TK savers that helped and they were like these steel brackets that captured as many bolts around the TK's mm -hmm. and became like this XO cage yeah. of the TK's. Huh. But advanced adapters sought to uh, solve that in the... Uh, early, let's see, early 2000s. And yeah. There was like some local Utah involvement on that too with the manufacturing and machining of those. Oh, okay. It was done by a machine shop in Murray. Did the machine work on the early Orions. Oh, very cool. For quite a few years. I don't know if they still do, but yeah, they uh, they offered that in a, both a four to one and three to one. So not only did you get this cast iron, super heavy duty case that used all your output shafts and even the nose cone, rear tail cone off of the one piece case, solved that breakage issue, but you got a three to one or four to one low range out of the deal too. Wow. Yeah. Fast forward now, they only do the four to one, but yeah, still sell them to this day. They're popular. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so cool. There's only other, there's, there's really, I mean, age is age, but there's only one other thing that I think just plagues Toyota in general, and that is corrosion. Sure. It's just the one thing. And it, it's kind of, I think people don't, don't, uh, I think they struggle with this idea of why does Toyota with, with Toyota being Toyota, why do they have these issues with frame cracks? Why do they have these issues with the frames that with rusting out? Why do these issues with the bodies rusting out? And uh, I wonder if you knew any, I long time ago, I heard the story about why this was and had to do with just, it just had to do with material supplies, where they could get their material, how they could get their material, that sort of thing. And uh, just their metal and the purity of their metal and everything like that. Yeah. I've never really do dove super deep into that aspect because personally I don't hold Toyota to any higher standard of their sheet metal than, than I do else. any other vehicle. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to find in Utah, is it, for those that don't know Utah, we got the great salt lake to our west oh, and yeah. the salt flats. And because of that, like we use mm -hmm. salt in the winter time, like it's mm -hmm. going out of style. They put it on the dry roads just in right. case it snows, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's gnarly how much snow they put down. Maybe, maybe there's like a class action lawsuit we can all get in with the state of Utah for corroding our vehicles <laughs> into small mm -hmm. pieces. But uh, yeah, they, it's certainly hard on vehicles in a lot of the Rust Belt states and, and Western states that use salt, they, they deal with it. But I don't think that the Land Cruiser sheet metal of the 70s was any different than a Jeep of the 70s. You just mm -hmm. happen to see more Land Cruisers still being restored on the road. So maybe that problem seems more prevalent. Yeah, not to say be. there's not a lot of people restoring CJ7s because there are a lot, but at least in the world I see, I see far more Land Cruisers or far more, you know, a lot of vehicles rusted at that time. Now in mo more modern history, the Tacoma certainly had a known issue right. with frames. Keep in mind, that's not a Japan-built vehicle that was built in the United States. And, Interesting. And uh, yeah. I'm going to say this, and if anyone uh, corrects me, I'd love to hear it if there's two, but that frame was built by a derivative of Dana Spicer. That was a, a company that was no owned kidding. by Dana Spicer yeah. at the time that built those frames for Toyota, and it came down to the corrosion paint they put on that was not properly applied mm -hmm. and or wasn't uh, up to the up to par and i've heard a lot of stories so th this is opinion or this is just what i've heard too is that there right. was maybe some epa reasons for that that the paint they used couldn't be as beefy as it needed to be whatever the issue was but mm -hmm. yes yeah, certainly like th that's been an issue but in land cruisers there's no known that's not a frame issue there's not like any year we say hey stay away from mm -hmm. that year because it has frame mm -hmm. issues every year that's been used in a rusty state could have frame yeah. issues but you know there's also plenty of examples like 
plenty of examples that are even Utah trucks that still have good frames. Oh yeah, mm. yeah. So that's not a m much of an issue in those in that Land Cruiser chassis. It is that you see in the Tacomas and and Tundra, some of the U.S. built mm -hmm. ones. And I'm not making that a U.S. versus Japan, but I think that was just the manufacture of those frames during that period was known to have some there issues some to the issues. point they had to do a mm -hmm. recall. That was a big deal that they it's were huge. You know, yeah. sending these. Pa you'd go behind Toyota dealerships and see a stack of frames waiting to get put underneath you know newer trucks too. These were four and five year old trucks. Wow. So, yeah, but yeah. I, that never happened in a Land Cruiser. There was never a frame recall, never, mm -hmm. uh, no no years that are super known. Now, the design of the bodies, uh, in some cases, was prone to just collecting uh, sediment, collecting that mm -hmm. road salt, and, like, blowing out the rear channels of 40s and the rocker panels. 60 series, the wheel arches commonly get rust, so mm -hmm. they have their problems, absolutely. But, but what vehicle didn't at yeah, that time? Yeah, it's kind of like, it, yeah, you know? it'd, be, it'd be maybe a little unfair to call them rust buckets right. when every vehicle of the 70s in Utah is mm -hmm. kind of a rust bucket. Yeah, I, I, can think, be. It, I think it's a little unfair, because it, be, and, and I just bring it up because I do think it is unfair that people are so critical of it, but I think the criticism comes with just the fact that Toyota is, is expected to be this yeah. amazing bomb-proof legacy mm -hmm vehicle which i i honestly think they kind of are you know what i mean the two vehicles that i find myself owning are jeeps and toyotas mm -hmm. which is very strange and dodges here and there and you know you've had a few yeah, i'll pick a, a few of these got a here beautiful and denali right next door right to us here yeah, yeah but yeah. the ones that i keep the ones that i keep oddly are the toyotas and the the jeeps mm -hmm. right and i only keep certain jeeps i only keep it's basically i i bought uh the jeep that i have behind you know the white one back there bought that in 96 right still have it has like 110,000 miles on it. It's a four banger. Still, it's the devil, you know. Yep. Every vehicle yep. is, the, you know, it's the devil, you know. You know and I, <clears throat> it's funny. I get asked a lot uh, in travel, like, why do you only take Toyotas? Is because that's the only thing you trust. And, and personally, it's the thing I know. And so I'm comfortable with what needs to be modified on them, what doesn't, what you shouldn't touch, and what you have to do to repair those, or what items you need to consider are going to need repair, possibly in the field. And I think that could be applied to every single vehicle that is sold these days. We've got a lot of great 4x4 platforms. Mm -hmm. Jeep's obviously doing some amazing things, as proven yeah. by the fact people are, guys like Dan Greck are driving around the world and you know doing amazing things. This new Bronco is going to be a neat platform, mm -hmm. and people will do really neat things with the new Bronco. Mm -hmm. Desert racing, they're going to, people will drive the Rubicon on it, people will drive it around the world or do the Trans-America Highway with it, or the Pan-America Highway, sorry. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's a it's like a little false to say that like the only thing peop vehicle you should leave home with is a Toyota. I love Toyotas. I mean, <laughs> look at my driveway. That's what we own. Yeah. But I also am <laughs> not naive to the fact that if somebody's got a well-prepared Jeep, I'd love to do a trip with them too. Like I got no, that's no, no beef there. Like know your vehicle. Mm -hmm. The best vehicle is the one with a full tank of gas and it's reliable. That's all <laughs> there is to it. Like yeah. don't get yep. too hung up on the brand details. It's like mm -hmm. a little annoying actually when people like use this as a friction point, like, oh, uh, well, I'm going to buy a Toyota one day so I can go do a trip like that. You know, it's like, you got a pickup truck now that will plenty do that drive. Mm -hmm. Like just fill the tank up and go. But mm -hmm. they make that like this little invisible roadblock for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I I um I met the opposite of what most Land Cruiser guys that I find are. I told this story already on the podcast, but I'll tell it to you. Oh, I'd love to hear because, it. Because yeah. um, I've met plenty of Land Cruiser guys that are they are Land Cruiser. It's that's it. That's all. Everything else is nothing. Right. Met plenty of those. Um, they exist. <laughs> and I met a dude at the top of MG Pass that was a Jeep only. Like okay. we're all there, Land Cruisers all over the. Oh well, excuse me, not FJ, Land Cruisers, FJ, FJ Cruisers. Cruisers. Sure, okay. right. I want to. I want to. <laughs> Fantastic vehicles. But the fact that they were Toyotas, <laughs> right? Toyotas all over the place, just spread out. And this guy was like, "Will you take a picture for me?" I said, "Sure." And I was going to take a picture, and he said, "Hey, I don't want any of these Toyotas in the backdrop." <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> "Okay." I mean, they're they're littered around the whole top of the pass here. But he's like, "Yeah." I'd, I'm a Jeep person. We're Jeep people only. And I was like, wow, they exist. They're real. <laughs> they totally it was exist. Like, I've, I've run into plenty of them. Maybe I see it a little more from my side <laughs> of being like surrounded by the Toyota version of right, that. Right, it exists. Right. Like, yeah. uh, I, I have to reconcile the fact that it is cool. There are so many people that are deep into those brands, maybe as mm -hmm. deep as I am about Toyota, though, appreciating yeah. Jeeps and appreciating how neat like some of the other platforms are. 
because it would be boring if everybody was so into the same thing. Like it would right. be mm -hmm. maybe great as a business if everybody were into land cruisers, but it would also be boring. It's kind of fun that there is some of that camaraderie, but people take it to extremes to some degree when mm -hmm. like they won't even maybe be seen on the trail with a Jeep. And mm -hmm. people ask me that, you know, like, oh, do you ever let Jeeps come along? And like, I do a lot of runs all year long with Expedition Utah and some of these other, I'm a member of, you know, have been a member of Red Rock Four Wheelers over the years and other mm -hmm. four by four groups. Mm -hmm. like. I don't care who they, what they drive. Like that yeah. doesn't matter to me. That's like really a weird focus to say, I'm not going to do a trip because they drive X, Y, Z vehicle. Right. Mm -hmm. um, off, off roaders are, we're, we're a group in and of itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we should unite. Yeah. We should. And off roaders should unite. unite. And it's fun to do a, tr a, gr a trip like FJ summit where it is celebrating the FJ cruiser. So I can appreciate mm -hmm. that and totally yeah, support yeah. love those events. But if that's like the, your event a year and the only one you'll go to, cause that's the only place you're going to have a collection of FJ cruisers. You got a problem. Like you need to, <laughs> you need to like maybe step back. You should go to that. And then next week you should go do some other cool yeah. trip with mm -hmm. some local guys that have Xterras and mm -hmm. gladiators mm -hmm. and doesn't well, maybe, matter what they're driving. Maybe go see a therapist somewhere. Go see th <laughs> yeah. 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 You, if not, you do need to see a therapist. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome to call me and I can coach you through how to get over doing a trail with some Jeep buddies. Cause I have a lot of dear friends that are, Xterra owners, Jeep owners, Rover mm. owners, you know. No. The Jeep wave is a real thing. It, it is, is a real thing. Yeah. You know. I think that should expand to just be your uh, off-road buddy the wave. The off-road buddy you know? wave. You know, call. it's happened. I've actually waved at Forerunner people and people in Forerunners, and I'm just like, hey, that's a nice Forerunner. Give them a wave, and they wave back, and I'm like, wow, that's actually pretty cool. It's cool. We do that in cruisers, you know, we take turns patting ourselves on the back when we see each other, you know, yeah. see another cruiser <laughs> guy. Yeah, we, that's yeah, our, that's yeah. our wave is the pat on the back. No, <laughs> it does happen. I, I've had the Jeep wave before when I've been in my 40 and then I think they kind of like get a little closer and like, oh man, did I just do something wrong? I just waved at a, I just waved at a Toyota. Is this wrong? Am I going to be in trouble for this? Yeah. Uh, shoot. Well, so let's talk, let's move on to off-road since we were just talking about off-road mm -hmm. we're talking about trails a little bit. Um, I want to, there's so much to talk about in here. Um, and I want to kick your expert expertise on it. Let's, let's talk about not your specific world yet. We'll be talking about that, but I want to talk about just the fact. So, uh, expeditions, Utah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, you were part founder in that? I am. Yeah. Hit myself and a few guys put that together just okay. as a, a resource for local travelers mm -hmm. or local Utahns looking to get out and explore kind of some of those off the beaten path places in Utah mm -hmm. without trying to like, uh, I don't know, overshare them. I know that's like mm -hmm. a big issue these days. Sure. Like our whole mm -hmm. thing is like, we don't give out GPS coordinates. We don't give, you can't mm -hmm. download our track file, but we have a lot of good historical based information to help you plan your own trip and, and get excited about those areas. Mm -hmm. I think that's a big part. That's an important part of, of uh, this kind of stuff. Actually, now you just say that I'm sitting here thinking about this. I'm like, right now we've got this Instagram culture, right? That it's all about being out there and taking that selfie or taking that image and stuff like that. And, and uh, I don't see that with, with the, legacy off-roaders I know or that kind of people I don't know if that will be part of the upcoming generation but I realize man the more accessible you make stuff like that you see people going out and ruining landmarks and everything like that mm -hmm. that's one part of it but man I'm just like think about how many people you could trap out there and they could die out in the middle of the wilderness because they're not <laughs> shouldn't be they're not there. prepping their own yeah. stuff you know they're not doing that homework to be able to travel out there because mm -hmm. you know the west is pretty crazy it's it's desert you don't just have water everywhere, man. It's there's, inhospitable there's, in many it is. places. There's plenty of places to no. die out there, you know, and you've got to be prepared. Um, I love, um, I've never done it and I need to do it, um, but I really want to do the San Rafael Swell, mm -hmm. right? And that's one of those where that's a big trip, right? Mm -hmm. That's not just a little day, let's go have fun for a few minutes. It could be a two night, you know, three, four day trip. It could be a week. There's so much to see down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hate to be, I hate to even give that secret away. Don't go to the swell. It's horrible. You don't yeah. want to be there. But <laughs> on the other hand, like everyone drives right past the swell as they go from Salt Lake to Moab. And that's like really neat. Now, mm -hmm. it doesn't have 50 plus trails within a couple hours of town like Moab does. Right. Moab is a an anomaly in the world. I've mm -hmm. been few places in the world that have that much kind of like off-road mm -hmm. culture and terrain. But as we all know, Moab is also getting loved to death. It's being, right. mm -hmm. it's busy. It's trails are busy. You do Hell's Revenge on a Friday or Saturday these days, it's busy. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to see it and I get it. It's amazing, but you've got a lot of side-by-side -side users. You've got mm -hmm. a lot of, still have That's mountain true. bikers and motorcycles and of course all the four by fours and everybody has a legitimate case to be there. They all mm -hmm. deserve it. It's public land, but it is personally like a little nauseating to go someplace that I used mm -hmm. to go and loved because of how 
yeah. remote and you kind of yeah, exactly. your own you experience. And now it's just like, all right, traffic jam, passing cars, you know, mm-hmm. it's, and that, that's tough. But th- this last year has been really hard on Utah's public lands in that regard, just the number of people out using them. And, and I think the 99 percentile of people are really good and understand the, right. the issues and le- mm-hmm. cleaning up after themselves, but also just staying on legal routes, camping in appropriate places, mm-hmm. having appropriate group sizes in, in areas that matters. But um, that, that 1% number just got a lot bigger this last year mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. of how many people no longer had Little League. They didn't have, you know, Saturday, yeah. Sunday commitments. So it was like, let's head to the desert and Mm -hmm. we saw abandoned campers and a lot of pallet Mm. you know trash and just a lot more stuff than we've seen the years past so frustrating we did two big cleanups last year of abandoned campers people Mm -hmm. just taking them out there and thought i'm not going to bring it home so that that's tough to see and uh that was that was part of expedition utah was kind of helping give people meaningful other places to go our Mm -hmm. urban trails in the wasatch front particularly like bountiful b right american fork canyon prov Mm -hmm. canyon uh, little Moab five mile pass like mm-hmm. nobody needed to share those with anyone because everybody already knew about right. them they were as, as popular mm-hmm. as they're going to be but what about maybe diversifying a little bit and giving people some other neat places to go see and, yeah. and take some pressure off of those really popular yeah. areas mm-hmm. so I think that was kind of one of the motives and another motive with with Exhibition Utah was uh, I would post a trip report like on a forum or share some pictures this was that was really even like pre-Instagram and Facebook days but the first thing you would get when you shared a couple photos of like the swell is like, oh, how do I get there? And like, do you, mm-hmm. can, do you, right. can, you, can, can you send me a Google Maps link or something? <laughs> yeah. You're like, no, but I can, <laughs> I can show you a website where you can go learn from other people's trip reports and read where they went. And mm-hmm. magazines were kind of fading at that time or you weren't mm-hmm. seeing that kind of content, particularly Utah based. So it's just worked out really well. And that's grown into a group that does annual events. We do a, a relic run event each year which is all 1970s and older vehicles which cool. is fun to go yeah. that's one of those i take the 40 on each year have mm-hmm. a lot over the years is you get to go use old camping gear coleman stoves and, and <laughs> we go do like three four day trips out yeah. of these old vehicles cool. so we're fixing vehicles all day long and towing each other and running out of gas <laughs> and vapor locking but it's it's awesome it's fun <laughs> Yeah, I so. really appreciate that, you know, information that you guys are kind of putting together because I think it is a mixed bag of like you're excited, especially the industry we're in, to see more people out on the trails and accessing, you know, these these really cool places. But at the same time, it's kind of hard when you go to your your spots and they're full. And I mean, we've been out to the spiral jetty so many times yeah. and never seen a soul out there. And then happened on it one day and it was like party in the parking lot oh, yeah. crazy was, I know. That, and now they're gonna like improve the parking lot area and put in more information yeah. there mm-hmm. and yeah. that they're looking at making it perhaps even a state park oh, are they really they yeah. Are. yeah i mean just, that makes sense but be, i think it's it, that pinterest or whatever you know it the, is the whole social media culture is just like way more people are, are accessing that information and like we said they have the time mm-hmm. and the means so i mean it's it's good but it's take the pressure off of some of these places because we got a lot of spots like we, we do got and a lot of great places to and, go and even the despite the the growing number of people going out and doing it because of this last year of covid and mm-hmm. like you know other mm-hmm. didn't have their football tickets anymore so let's go right. camping it was a lot of that truthfully that that happened that portrayed itself in utah like went out to dell early in the year right after like kind of that initial weird quarantine phase they start saying like, hey, but camping's okay, or the, you know, right. using public mm-hmm. land's okay. Mm-hmm. Dell, Utah, like on I-80, like an hour west of Salt Lake here, yeah, was a, like a zoo. I'd never seen so many people there. Mm. There's always, a, that's a popular OHV area. It's great. There's a cross-country open travel, some fun tracks, some great riding, but like it was just amazing to see how many people are like, I'm getting out of town because of everything mm-hmm. going on in town and, and using public lands. And uh, but part of that is that we were touching on and, and started with like the kind of the Instagram ability of something. I don't even mm-hmm. know if that's a word, but it's one I'm going to use. And people choose locations or a lot of modern travelers, be it even hardcore off-roaders or whatever label they want to give themselves are looking at how Instagrammable a place is oh, yeah. and choosing oh, yeah. where they want to go. Like, what's it going to look like in photos? And there's these weird phenomenons like there's these uh, the Tintic, uh, Tintic Range Railroad Tunnel Number One out by oh. Eureka, and it's often uh-huh. called like the Goshen Tunnel. It gets all these Eureka right, Tunnel, yeah, but it's yeah. the Tintic Range Railroad Tunnel Number One. Mm-hmm. We've been like I've been going there for like 20 years. I first went there with like a Wasatch Cruiser Run mm-hmm. pre-internet or pre-Facebook social media days, and we did that as part of like a little off-road rally we were doing that day. And I thought, man, this place is so cool. But the tunnel was a little narrower. The entrances were a little narrower. Nowadays, like on Saturdays, there could be like 50 plus people like going to take their pictures going through this train tunnel. And it's like you could drive a car there, like literally 
Wow. No joke. You huh. know, but people like make that a, hey, let's go do an off-road trip and go take pictures coming through the tunnel and do this mm-hmm. big thing. It's mm-hmm. And it's cool. People are out seeing public lands. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's neat. It's great. But I think they're getting a little too focused on, hey, I saw this cool photo of that. Now I want to go there. It's like the fun for me is get your benchmark atlas out, open it up to some random page, start looking at some area that you have a, an interest mm-hmm. in some history and go plan your own trip there. Don't don't see what their photos look like and just want to recreate that same yeah. photo. Yeah. 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 There's so much that Utah has to offer. I mean, if, if we're just the West, let's talk about Utah and then let's talk about the West. But Utah in itself, I mean, um, so the Swell is one of those legendary places that I need to go just because, I mean, I was born in Southern Utah. I think I, I really should at least experience that, Absolutely. right? I was a, I was a, I was born in Panguitch, Not right? Far. Tiny yeah. little town. Yeah. So I feel like that's a place that I do need to go. But um, besides that, I mean, where you have growth and, and I'm, I'm right with you on the Moab thing. Moab's just, y- you said it's getting loved to death. That's a perfect way to actually see it. I talked with this w- on the last podcast with Sarge, this problem you have with it, with those people that they're driving through and, and you even have seasoned off-roaders that do this and it kind of pisses me off, but they're so eager to get through the trail. They're so eager to not drive over that rough spot uh-huh. that they go around to the soft spot and then pretty mm-hmm. soon you have a three or four lane wide the weave gets wider yeah now. and it's it's just that kind of stuff that it's um it's beating everything up but like we have we have sand hollow that's kind of coming into play that's Booming. that's kind of new and yeah. i think that's good mm-hmm. yeah. um that's a good area of growth um i hear there's tons and tons of trails down there right yeah, awesome stuff um I hear there's, uh, we didn't go into it too deep, but Sarge is saying actually Delta area. There's there's lots of trails up in that area. Mm-hmm. Delta had more. Unfortunately, they Did saw they? some land closures that oh, like lost Cat really? Canyon and some others. In fact, if you go hike Cat Canyon nowadays, you would never know that there was this amazing 4x4 four four trail there 15 and 20 mm-hmm. years ago. But yeah, there's some cool, Delta's definitely still got lots of neat terrain, a massive mm-hmm. basin area. And, and particularly if you're into kind of more... Uh, you know, just long distance travel and remote desert travel. Yeah. Delta is a great jump off point to grab a tank of fuel and head west because you can head out to the Crystal Ball Caves and out to Topaz Mountain and mm-hmm. Massa Basin. Mm-hmm. There's gold panning opportunities. I mean, there's so much neat stuff over there. Ghost cool. towns. Yeah, Delta's cool. Wow. Mm. Go to Delta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like Delta's a rad, rad town. There's a, a good community of off roaders there in Delta, too. Is mm-hmm. there? Yeah. I heard, and I heard there's a lot in price, too. Absolutely. Price area, there's <laughs> a lot of fun stuff. I mean, there's all these areas that I bet are, and it's not that we want to just clog up the trails, but we want, I mean, diversify. Diversify a little That's bit, get out a little bit more. Yeah. Overlanding, I think, is one of those things that I love that is becoming more popular. Um, just because it really opens up this idea of really getting out there on a lot of these trails that are very less traveled. Um, something that I want to do, which um, it's a longer project. It's a longer idea project. I'm not going to get into it here, but it has to do with running the Pony Express. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we'd be we'd be doing some filming on that and stuff like that. But Sarge was telling me that you've actually done a lot of the Pony Express outside of Utah. Yeah, also. We, we drove. So it's pretty much all pavement from Missouri to Utah, to, to mm-hmm. like into Salt Lake proper. Mm-hmm. Uh, but from Salt Lake, you go out to a uh, five mile pass and at five mile pass is the jump off point for the Pony Express Tour. And that, that road out to Vernon used to be paved. They've actually since like cut up the pavement and returned it back to dirt because it's cheaper to maintain for the mm-hmm. county, et cetera. But anyways, point of all that is that's where you hop off on dirt and you can be on dirt all the way on the Pony Express out to the border of Utah, Nevada. And then about like, Man, I'm going to call it 90 for, 95% of Nevada is in the dirt and mm-hmm. into California. So we did drive it from Salt Lake to South Lake Tahoe wow. uh, following the original Pony Express. And we uh, yeah, followed that group of guys. It was kind of neat the way we did it. Had everybody learn about a couple different stations along the way because there's home mm-hmm. stations where the riders would ride between home stations back and forth. But then you had like relay stations in between. That's where they'd get a fresh horse and kind of bounce. So we stopped at as many of those home stations and relay stations as we could identifying those. Wow. And we've done sent some documentation of those areas and, and gone out and visited them a, a lot over the years. I do. I've got some property out on the Utah Nevada border in a little ghost town called Gold Hill. So I use the Pony mm. Express Trail as my thoroughfare to get to there all the time. And it's cool. right. So I, I love the Pony Express is an amazing opportunity. And that's another one that has gotten a lot more use this last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people go out to see the wild horses. A lot of people mm-hmm. go out to see some of the ghost towns. Um, 
but it's a neat area and I get why people want to go see that and it and uh, this certainly the further you go west the less people you're going to see so if you're looking to get out there to have some solitude and have a, a neat experience by yourself be it camping or just for a day trip Pony Express is a great place to do that. Hmm. How long was that trip all the way to South Lake Tahoe? I think we did it in four nights four or five nights mm -hmm. yeah hmm. and you could do it in I mean if you were driving straight through you could do it in a couple of days i mean but mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's definitely worth Have slowing fun and exactly it, yeah it's know? worth slowing down see the sights uh but yeah we passed overall very few people on that entire trip it's not a uh, common use route and, and particularly nevada that central nevada the deserts of nevada are amazing in the number of how few people are out there now there are a lot of ranching operations and there's mining operations so there are uh, you know other users out there and other interests out there but compared to the the utah side even there's far less than there is uh, mm. in nevada yeah. wow yeah did you know this is just i talked about this last time too my apologies apologies for Love watching it. this over again but um cameron you know cameron cameron right? egan yeah you bet you okay did you know his grand his great 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 grandfather is an egan was an egan, egan yeah. is the egan yeah. that pioneered yeah, that yeah i'd it's heard that wild, before huh? that's wild yeah it's pretty crazy. Yeah. That's part of the reason why I want to go out there um, is just because I'm like, that's a pretty, pretty crazy rich history, it right? Is. When you know somebody whose ancestry did that. Well, we too. should plan a trip and drag Cameron to come out. Absolutely. And get him to come do a Pony Express trip. Yeah. He can bring a Land Rover. You can bring this beautiful Denali. Yeah. yeah. I'd be in a Land Cruiser. <laughs> I'd actually probably um, bring, bring your Jeep. I'd probably bring Gladiator. Yeah, bring. Yeah. Oh, that'd be a perfect. Love people. the Gladiator. Um, I'm actually really impressed with Gladiators. Mm -hmm. I just got to yeah, say neat, that. Neat platform. I'm really impressed with what Jeep did with their that. Mm -hmm. They're pretty pretty solid. That and uh, maybe or the uh, or the GX. Yeah, GX is a good one for that as well. well. Freaking I've, love the GX 460s. Yeah, I've like the, a, even though the new one, even though the, the front of it's kind of weird and ugly yeah, looking, I fixed that a little with more my yeah. bumper. <laughs> but you know, the aftermarket has a way of solving all it those does. problems on any it? legitimate platform. And that's what's so cool. I'm yeah. just talking but trash. The, the anyway. GX, the 460s are beautiful. They're great. Vehicles. Yeah, I mean the Prado basically. That's what they are. So quiet, tidy inside, really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just stalwart. Very we, small, we, very maneuverable. Yeah, we've got a GX 460 at home, and we absolutely love it. It's like a great vehicle mm -hmm. they're what, nice what were you gonna say oh i was just saying i i do have a reunion planned in carson city oh that's right so, we do. you know there you go mm -hmm. yeah make it happen that'd summer. be the time to drive it yeah it would be might that'd as be well that'd yeah. be something if you're else going that you know yeah. i'd rather take i'll put that a, route <laughs> uh, yeah I, you absolutely should I, I i'd put that as a not a challenge everybody but like go explore it it's cool but i'm gonna put a little asterisk next to that mm -hmm. is it is very remote Mm -hmm. There is not a lot of places to buy fuel along the way. So from the time you leave Vernon, which they do have fuel in Vernon, mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, I've been there times where they don't, but there used to be a fuel station in uh, Ibapa out on the Utah Nevada border that sold fuel. They haven't for a lot of years. So mm -hmm. you're forced to either go up to Wendover mm -hmm. or down to Baker, Nevada is like your closest fuel, like in proximity to the Utah Nevada border. Wow. Beyond that, you have to go like quite a bit further in Cherry Creek or like Ely area to get fuel. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just if you're planning a Pony Express trip, and I'm not worried about you guys at all, you got your Jerry's, you got your plenty of fuel, mm -hmm. <laughs> but for others that maybe are looking at a Pony Express trip, do your research, yeah. learn about the history, because that's the only reason it's going to be neat to go do. Otherwise, it's just a dirt road if you don't stop and look at the sights and sounds and learn yeah. about what was there. Mm -hmm. uh, but also just... It is the desert. It's the desert. It is mm -hmm. hospitable, and mm -hmm. nobody's coming for you. You mm -hmm. know, they're not going to know where to look for you. So, you know, plan your trip accordingly. You don't have cell service right no. yeah. there either. <laughs> yeah. In southern Utah, where, where just just so we can wrap it up, where else is there that you know of in Utah that is like, where can we where can we tell people that this is a good place? I mean, Bears Ears. That was one of the things I never even heard of Bears Ears mm -hmm. when all that went down. Um, I didn't even really know that was a place to where people were doing much exploring. Well, fortunately, you know most I mean? the world hadn't. So that was the that was the beauty of the place. And the, yeah. the cat's a little out of the bag about the Bears Ears. And it's funny it gets that name because it's it's a holistically, it's a much bigger area. It's the Elk Ridge, Blue Mountains, Dark Canyon. Mm -hmm. That's such a neat area. Bears Ears is kind of one of the, the big features of that. And that is a neat area to go to explore. It's nothing technical. So if mm -hmm. you're dragging your rock crawler down there, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of other users there now because now it's it became a checkbox on a lot of people's lists when they heard about this area that had mm. previously been undiscovered because kind of the irony of protecting this place is in fact we just it mm -hmm. was exploited i've never seen mm -hmm. you know I've, I've spent a lot of time there over the last few decades mm -hmm. and uh, i've never seen more people there in my life as i have the last few years and part yeah. of that's going to be because of the 
uh, number of people out exploring and the growing user base. Our user base is getting bigger naturally, mm -hmm. uh, but also a big part of that is that it's been exposed. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a, again, it's not a bad thing. You want to share and let people know of these neat opportunities. Um, but you ask about other areas. Uh, I love the La Salle Mountains just south of yeah, Moab. Yeah, those are pretty amazing. People avoid Moab like the plague in the summer just due to the heat. It's yeah, hot and if you're out on those hot. red rock trails. But man, the La Salles to the south are beautiful mm. mountains. Again, nothing super technical, but beautiful. We talked about the swell. Um, I love the West Desert of Utah. And when I say the West Desert, that's everything from the Idaho border to the Arizona border, basically west of I-15. Right. There is so much to see predominantly BLM land, which means it's usually open to travel, much of that on designated routes. So it's that's absolutely the user's job to know where they can drive and where they cannot drive. Mm -hmm. Don't expect people to spoon feed that to you with a sign on the road. That's often, you know, people say, oh, there wasn't a sign that said that was closed, but know where you're supposed to be. But just keep in mind, you can drive from the Utah-Idaho border to the Utah-Arizona border nearly exclusively on dirt on the west side of the state. That's mm -hmm. cool that you can do that stuff like that. Cool. And yeah. you can cross into Nevada dozens of different ways mm -hmm. coming from the West Desert. You can go, so we've got the Transcontinental Railroad up around the north end of the Salt Lake, Great Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. We've got just the whole West Desert. Knolls, the, the sand Knowles, dunes yep. just west of here. Mm -hmm. It's traditionally been a, a like a ATV playground, mm -hmm. motorcycles and ATVs, but it's a lot of fun in a 4x4. Four four. Yeah. Like I totally enjoy driving in sand. Wintertime months out there in the sand is a lot of fun in a 4x4 four because four mm -hmm. you can kind of crawl around when the sand's got a little more moisture in it. And there is some open desert area around there that's a lot of fun too. So we uh, we desert race. We race a Land Cruiser, do you know desert racing, mm -hmm. uh, and some of the races are at, at Knowles. And like it's one of are our favorite really? races. Yeah, they I do a Knowles that. race. Yeah, Boar, which is yeah. the Bonneville Off Road Racing, mm -hmm. uh, Utah based racing series we participate in. Boar does a Knowles race that's like it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And that same route, while it's a lot of fun in the race cars, we're zooming around. It's it's also like fun to just go play around in your in your four by four, mm -hmm. anything with a good set of tires, air them down, and you know have a buddy there to tug you out when you get stuck. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Knowles cool. is a lot of fun. You also have what's the national park just down in Nevada that you can cross Great over Basin. into? There's Great, Great Basin. Great Basin yeah. just outside of Baker. Yeah, Great mm -hmm. Basin's cool. Like you can tour the to Lehman Caves or some like, great yeah. drives up into the higher elevations there. Uh, so that's a great destination and. You can travel on dirt out of Vernon again, mm -hmm. do Pony Express Trail, then head south down to uh, to Baker and and head on into the the, uh, the national park there. So that's a, a yeah. great area to explore, and mm -hmm. it's one of the I don't know if I've just if this is a fact or just you know, generally speaking, it's one of the least visited national parks in the Western it is. U.S. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's also one of the darkest places. The, yeah, like to see the stars, stars and the Milky Way and stuff like that. I think it's like a that. designated. It is. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. Like a nice dark guy. spot or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've done some them. neat trips. It's the Lehman Caves. You can schedule a tour out there. The, the caves are really cool. Like Timpanogos Caves, neat. Mm -hmm. You have to do a little bit of a hike up American Fork Canyon. They're neat. But Lehman Caves are like that. They're they're cool. They're really mm -hmm. neat to go see. And it's a great family one because kids mm -hmm. can hike the cave. And yeah. there is uh, both uh, improved and primitive camping in that greater area. Mm -hmm. Cool. There's so much to offer is the truth of it. it just it, when we're talking about the West, I think the more, the more that you move out of the West, you, you just have more settlement. You have more, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? There is areas, the Dakotas and stuff like that. There's plenty of rugged areas mm -hmm. and stuff like that, but Nevada has so much. Mm -hmm. Arizona has so much. New Mexico. There's just so many neat things out that, uh, it's good to, I, I like that overlanding is a huge thing of growth, right? I mean, rock crawling was the thing. And then it kind of like, it, it, it used to be you drive your vehicle to the trail, then it was like you're towing your vehicle to the trail, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a huge step up in what was going on there, but now you're like, you're, you're towing your vehicle everywhere. I just love the idea of, uh, you're, you're, we're kind of moving back to those roots. I, I don't know about you, but rock crawling to me when I was doing it um, in my Jeep back here, which I was too poor to ever afford lockers or anything like that, dude. So I was doing four, what what back then was four rated trails, uh -huh. right? Four plus rated trails. I don't know what the rating system, how kind of it works went to now. The 10 but scale yeah, now, so no, the 10, 10 yeah, but moved everything. I was doing the harder trails with open diffs and it was all just driving skill, man. And I loved it, but it also got stressful, mm -hmm. right? It just, um, one of the most stressful trails for me is a cliffhanger. I just don't, mm -hmm. I don't enjoy it. I last two times I've done it, I didn't enjoy it. And the reason why is because I'm like, okay, I know I'm capable of doing all this stuff, but there's something about being on a thousand foot cliff yeah. right here. Perilous. That's just not, I'm not in, right? It's just, I'm getting too old <laughs> mm -hmm. for this, right? Um, I just don't enjoy it. So um, now that I've moved more towards, my focus has been more towards Orland, overlanding. I'm really enjoying just the exploration, right? I have a fully kitted rig. 
so I know I can handle what I can get to. I mean, Sarge was telling me about silt beds you ran into out in um, on the Pony Express Trail and stuff like that. Dude, silt can sink you sure. if you yeah. if you hit it. It did. Right. You know what I mean? Did it? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I mean, yeah. you've got to be prepared for that stuff. So having a fully prepared rig mm -hmm. for overlanding is still kind of a must, right? But it's not one of those things where your your whole goal here is just to go out and be technical mm -hmm. yeah. all day. Technical technical crawling is fun, right? Um, but I just love the I love the move towards overland mm -hmm. that yeah. we're seeing. I, th I think that those those exact fa uh, factors are why it's become so popular. One of the major reasons. One, it's it's a lot. Uh, the barrier of entry is is much lower. That bar is much mm -hmm. lower to build a quote unquote overland vehicle. I know everyone's got their definition of that, and I'm not, we're, we won't get too deep into mm -hmm. you know what is what isn't or how you build one. Unless you want to, I'm always always up for the conversation. <laughs> but but with a rock crawler, it was kind of given. It had to have yeah. big tires, strong axles, locking mm -hmm. differentials. You know, heavy duty steering. I mean, like there were like check boxes it had to have if you were going to go do four plus trails or a five rated or on the new scale stuff. If you were going to go do buggy only trails or uh, compete in those days too. I was fortunate to uh, have a good friend Carl Whitmore, who you know still do a lot of work with to this day. Carl and I competed in U Rock. He had a f you know a couple different full tube chassis buggies that we did. Uh, professional rock crawling with and traveled around the u.s and and did that and it was like so it was so fun but you knew that was a rock crawler right there mm -hmm. was like no confusion that that's what that vehicle was and mm -hmm. what it was purpose built for i would say say the same about desert racing like you don't casually just hop in this denali and say i'm going to go be a desert mm -hmm. racer today right <laughs> even if you made a few mods it's extensive mods and once they're done it's kind of irreversible and mm -hmm. very uh, focused mods that like now make it no longer fun to drive on the road because it doesn't have a windshield perhaps or you know there's just there's just changes to make but but building these kind of like tr uh, trail rigs and and uh, touring overlanding there's still something you can drive to work so mm -hmm. therefore you don't have to have two vehicles you're driving it to the trail so you don't have a tow vehicle and a trailer that's mm -hmm. a big barrier of entry for somebody building a rock crawler you don't drive your rock crawler to little moab for the day you tra right. you trailer you it, it. Mm -hmm. you don't you, moab you certainly trailer it johnson mm -hmm. valley etc so I, I think that's a big part of why it became popular is because this the the barrier of entry was much lower. It was yeah. easy to build this rig and get out and see a lot of neat places. It's more family friendly. Absolutely. It's more social. Yeah. Um, but I still think uh, desert racing and rock crawling are still fantastic, and I love oh, that yeah. it's still happening. I love that I, I actually see particularly rock crawling, a lot of people getting back into building buggies, getting back mm. into uh, doing those more difficult trails, and I think it's a little bit of maybe the places they like to go are starting to get crowded. Mm -hmm. So like, hey, if I do this, I can kind of go start seeing some of those underserved or underutilized areas that are those tougher trails. And they're certainly still popular too, plenty of people. And especially side-by-sides are getting so capable. You're starting to see them get into yeah. like rock crawling trails. And it's neat to see what guys are doing with a uh, really built side-by-side. -side. But uh, yeah, overlanding is kind of a little lower cost of entry as far as what the vehicle needs to have now people certainly take that to the extreme and spend mm -hmm. every bit and much more mm -hmm. outfitting them mm -hmm. and uh just that's cool people know what they need i think they need a maybe go, go start doing some of those trips and really define what actual needs are i mean mm -hmm. really you need mm -hmm. a full tank of gas a good set of tires and maybe some uh definitely some armor and you know your proper equipment people make those I use that word invisible roadblocks again where like hey as soon as i have all this done then i'll go on a trip like that where mm -hmm. the reality is you can do the Pony Express. Like there's people that live in Kaleo, Utah that drive their sedans yeah. across the Pony Express every day <laughs> mm -hmm. and get back to Kaleo. So don't think you have to have like mm -hmm. this most amazingly built gladiator to get there. You mm -hmm. don't, or you don't have to have this fully decked out Land yeah. Cruiser to get to the Utah Nevada border, like mm -hmm. drive yeah. a car there. But, right. yeah. but you're right. Chances favor the prepared. And as if you start finding yourself doing more and more of that stuff and start exploring mm -hmm. maybe some of those spur trails off of that and into cool camp areas, you want to start having an outfitted vehicle and and uh, that's, I think, why overlanding got so popular is it's, uh, it's fun for gear junkies, men and women that love to kind of mm -hmm. have gear, mm -hmm. use their gear. It's fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I, I just found out what our next podcast with you on it is going to be about. Uh -oh. we're just gonna, we are just going to go gear crazy. Okay. The whole podcast. Yeah. Now let's do it. So let's talk, but, so we'll do that next time. But let's talk about this. Let's talk about, because you brought it up, let's talk about desert racing because I'm pretty sure you were on a team mm -hmm. that as far as your class, you guys won the Baja 1000. We did. We Is we've been correct? We did. Yeah. We took first in class last year just and we run, it's called Stock Full. Mm -hmm. So we run a, uh, 
stock Land Cruiser. I'm using my quotations because in desert yeah. racing, it's still a stock class, but it's got no glass, full cage. You know, it's been mm-hmm. prepared specifically for desert Suspensions racing. Suspensions mid modified, super it's, modified. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we run stock suspension components as far as upper and lower control arms and our well front and rear and our links. Yeah, but we're able to have a lot of suspension as far as shock and bypass shock. So right. it does have a lot of more addition, additional travel, but far more compliant suspension, particularly for racing. So now this is. Did you guys? Is this a separate one than what, um, I'm forgetting his name right now, but who used to race that Land Cruiser so before that? This was, was Lexus, built by Lexus, yeah. USA, yeah. Uh, with a program inspired and, and kind of brought apart by a gentleman named Joe Bacall. Yeah, so Joe you're probably Bacall. thinking of Joe. That's, that's and Joe was, was involved in FJ mm-hmm. Cruisers early on, some of the yeah. early development and training and testing on FJ Cruisers, so he's a longtime Toyota enthusiast. Yeah, he's an awesome dude. Really neat I mean, guy. he's, really, he's really amazing. Yeah, so he so. he raced that before, and that's exactly part of our story getting involved. A, a handful of local Land Cruiser guys, just some good buddies of, of mine, uh, a lot of them you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had always talked about desert racing, something like, hey, we want to do this. It's, like, it's so cool. And we'd followed the Baja 1000 and like on a much grander scale, the, the Dakar Rally. And we decided let's go down to the Baja 1000, like watch one year and mm-hmm. see like what we can information we can gain and what like could we ever do this? Mm-hmm. And during that year, we'd gone a couple times, but I think it was the second year we were there. Joe Bacall was racing the Lexus, and he mm-hmm. actually had a suffered a mechanical failure. Uh, I think like a track bar bolt came loose or broke, mm-hmm. and we actually helped him wrench on it in the pits. Mm-hmm. And he was there by himself. His, his chase crews weren't there yet, so we're like there helping this guy get this car. <laughs> and he went on to win that year yeah. in his oh. class. And we just kind of formed a little bond. And every time I would bump into him at SEMA or different off-road events throughout the you know, U.S. here, would see him and a handful of different times would mention, hey, if you're ever going to sell that, you know, we, we'd mm-hmm. love to buy that. We had since bought a little, it's called a Class 5 car. It's a Volkswagen bug-based car. Okay. But it was a full tube chassis, but it still ran Volkswagen engine, drivetrain, transaxle. And we were racing that. We'd been racing that Utah Boar Series. And we did our first year go race the Baja 1000 in that we finished it like amazing like that thing was beat to death we were beat to death we (laughs) we, like had no clue what we were doing and here we went and did it but we knew the land cruiser was a like a more permanent solution for us both because we're land cruiser guys it would kind of be fun to be involved in that but also that volkswagen every race we had to fully tear that thing down and i'm not talking about just like all the suspension link steering like a normal race prep you're talking motor we sent the engine to a company in california the tranny to a different company to Uh have that service like because the one or two times we didn't, we found out the hard way when we like blew a motor apart mm-hmm. or destroyed the transmission. So like every race nearly, we were sending that off. Fast forward, Joe, we had kept mentioning that. And he always said, ah, I can never sell that. I won the championship in that. That's my mm-hmm. baby. And then life changed, his, his needs and you know, focus has changed. And he reached out, actually, I think he reached out to me on Facebook one day and said, hey, you still interested in the Land Cruiser? And mm-hmm. I passed it on, uh, Darren, I got our team kind of negotiated, Mark and Dave and Ryan, everyone got involved. And we all said like, yes, let's do this. So. We've been racing the, the 200 series Land Cruiser now for about eight years. I think we've run the 1000 in it six times now. Wow. Mm. We don't, we've never touched the motor. We do an oil change, put some wow. spark plugs in it. Such we've an amazing motor. Never touched the tranny or the T case. Isn't that just amazing? It's amazing. Like for yeah. desert racing, it's amazing. Like our race preps are all the suspension gets fixed, new upper control arms because the bushings get just destroyed after a thousand mile race. The racks get play in them. I mean, there's, we have to replace a lot of parts. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong, but we do not touch the motor tranny or T case. Is that the 4.7 motor in It's that? a 5.7. It's 5.7? It's yeah, it's a 3.7. It really? Yeah, it's a 5.7. Wow. We have dusted that motor like to the point it wouldn't run because like the, we had filtration issues and it was like just completely full of dust. We oh, clean it wow. all out, do a leak down, and it's still good to go. Huh. One of these days, it's going to give up the ghost on us, but it's got 25,000 <laughs> yeah. miles of like hard, hard race miles, yeah. pushing 37s, running in some nasty desert racing silt, huh. and we're hard on that thing. Such amazing drive hard. trains. Yeah. You know and what it, I mean? So that's why the Land Cruiser yeah. happened for us. and. Uh, yeah, because that we all love that drivetrain. A bunch of us are, uh, you know, own 200 series or the Tundras with those motors, so mm-hmm. we were all really familiar. And it was a lot easier for us to wrap our heads around uh, maintaining a race program with that engine. We knew nothing about Volkswagen. It's like that's why we we're sending that <laughs> yeah. motor to somebody that did. We knew nothing about like transaxles and Weddles and all these bus transmissions that they were using in Volkswagen. So anyway, the Land Cruiser just made better sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this cool. this so this is 2020. 2020? Th- this was, last year? It was 2020, right? 2021. So just, it was 2021. Uh, yeah, just about okay. four or five months ago that we yeah, won the class. Okay. They did race it last year. You, okay. Yeah. Won in that class. You've But you guys have been doing this for six years now? Uh, more than that. I think, uh, man, I have to... 
for the 1000 though specifically i think right? 2012 is when we first raced the, the Mahalo really? 1000 yeah and most of the time you guys finish usually haven't you always finished we've finished seven out of eight or eight out of nine but i think it's seven out of eight times i'd have to mm-hmm. i'd have to think back but yeah and we've only not finished one like, year you were like second place you were just like mm-hmm. it was like 30 seconds or something like that you we, guys were we've right. taken second to rod hall in his uh mm-hmm. in the hummer and they're, yeah. they're a fantastic legend team uh, yeah. we took second uh one year to toyota in their tundra the factory supported tundra team oh, dear yeah. friends they did they had a great race and then we we have taken first other times as well so last year wasn't our first first in class it was just perhaps our most celebrated Mm because social media is bigger nowadays Mm -hmm. but yeah (laughs) Yeah. that is so cool so and that's just one of the things that you do so we hit on that let's talk about expedition seven Mm -hmm. because a lot of people this is a little obscure a lot of people have never even heard of this but um i know about it because i know who greg miller is Mm -hmm. uh i'm pretty sure I don't know if it's still up there, but I remember, I think it's still on Amazon. You can watch it. Um, I think it's available to watch, right? Because you get, it was filmed, wasn't it? Yeah, it was fully filmed. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's ever been on Amazon. That would be news to me, but it very well could be. Uh, you can watch it on Expedition7.com, and there is about okay. a, like a call the 10 to 20 minute episode on each continent of okay. that. And, and Expedition 7 was a global journey to take the same land cruiser to all seven continents. And that happened. Just the same single land cruiser? Yeah, the, the goal was the same single one. But as part of that, the fleet is actually, I've got to count here, one, two, three, four, six vehicles. Mm-hmm. And because different different uh, continents require different needs. And as the trip started with two, uh, they're called VDJ-78s. They're a mm. V8 factory turbo diesel land cruiser, Troopy, that troop carrier we talked about mm-hmm. earlier. That's called the mm-hmm. 78 series. Those were from New Zealand. Uh, that particular model because it had the factory locking differentials, the V8 diesel. Uh, Greg and Scott Brady from Overland Journal are the ones that selected those platforms. Mm-hmm. So they uh, started with two, and then when like it kind of each continent, every other continent, another vehicle was added for various reasons, filming to carry a film crew. Uh, one case would be we did the Canning Stock Route when we crossed Australia. We did a. Uh, the Canning Stock Route, which is one of the most remote trails and longest trails in the world, like certainly a top five. It's, mm-hmm. so I think, 1,899 kilometers of self-supported travel. Oh. There's one little uh, Aborigine outpost town in the middle where you can buy fuel at times. We did because it was available. Mm-hmm. But we've had to build a truck on that trip just to carry fuel for the other trucks. Wow. So that was a truck... Uh, I drove and was able to uh, go over there and spend that some time ahead of time building it. Like we had driving on a, a bomb. Pretty much. A bomb. Diesel, fortunately. A diesel <laughs> oh, fuel. Was it? Okay. it was diesel fuel. Yeah, but yeah, we had, we had nine <laughs> fuel drums in the back of that truck. They weren't full 55-gallon drums. They're kind of like these uh, like 30-inch tall. Maybe That's still got to be I want to say they were 28-gallon. Wow. T- it was heavy. Yeah, yeah, but that truck has leaf springs that are about six inches tall. It has, wow. you know, it mm-hmm. rides wow. like it when it's unloaded. But it's a fat. And that <laughs> all that fleet is on display at the Land Cruiser Museum in Salt Lake. You can see all of those vehicles. So... It started as uh, Greg Miller and Scott Brady had talked about driving around the world and then kind of Mm -hmm. spun up as like, what about driving the same vehicle around the world? And that kind of spun up the trip. I was invited to be uh, like really fortunate and humbled to be invited to be part of the North America segment. So Mm -hmm. they came to the swell, actually led Mm -hmm. them on a swell trip uh, as part of like their, their North America send off. And Greg invited me to be part of the drive during such from uh, Salt Lake to uh, Cape Spear, Nova Scotia. So across the rest of the United States, they'd already done from Prudhoe Bay to Salt Lake. Wow. And then we did Salt Lake to Cape Spear. And I thought that was going to be my involvement. I was like, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And I was driving this uh, a 79 series single cab truck that was part of the trip. And then subsequently I got invited to do Australia. Uh, my role kind of got a little bigger each time. They, they were will, uh, mm-hmm. willing to lean on me and have me be involved in more parts of it. So I ended up building one of the vehicles And then subsequently kind of did the remainder of the trips with the exception of they took one vehicle and that's why the one that went to all seven went to antarctica and that Mm -hmm. had to be flown there on a plane it's a very cost intensive project and so that was greg's uh person the the truck he personally drove which uh its name is fernway and that truck has been (laughs) on all seven continents and is in the museum so it's a very historical vehicle and then uh they we drove across most continents, so did a lot of off-road on, on all these. So we drove through mm-hmm. Central America, all through South America, did uh, the, the Skeleton Coast in Namibia. I mean, did some amazing epic drives that are uh, some, some of the most fond memories I have. We, when they got to Antarctica, and again, I wasn't on that trip, but they only took the one vehicle. But the preparation to drive that to the South Pole was going to be so intensive, it would permanently... Uh, change the vehicle like have to tub out the wheel wells to run these really? big tires and lighten it up no and kidding. change so much on it that 
it was decided like, nope, let's take that truck there. They put 38s mm -hmm. on it, changed the lift, did drive that on Anarka, but they they had an Arctic truck prepared, which okay. is a company in Iceland that builds these Arctic trucks. They're based totally. on Hiluxes yep. on, in this case, 44 inch tires. Mm -hmm. wow. And that one drove to the South Pole and then across the South Pole to the Rice off, Rice, Ross ice shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Greg and uh, Scott f were the only two that did that trip out of the whole E7 team. They And they did that uh, successfully and had a, a grueling trip across that polar ice mm. or across Antarctica, but it worked. Mm -hmm. And then in 2018, so all the fleet came back to the U.S. We completed the seven continents and that truck came back to the U.S. And Greg had one more crazy idea in mind, and that was to cross Greenland. It had never been crossed from oh, the southern tip of Greenland to the to northern, northern tip. Wow. It had been crossed east to west by Arctic trucks. Mm -hmm. um, so Greg partnered with uh, friends at Arctic trucks, and we did in 2018 the first crossing of Antarctica or sorry, of Greenland from the south tip to the north tip mm -hmm. uh, from land to land in that same Arctic truck. So now that one at the museum has been to the South Pole and across Greenland, pretty amazing vehicle as mm -hmm. far as the equity that has in the travel. Mm -hmm. And Arctic truck brought some vehicles. So we had three vehicles we did that crossing in. See, what's amazing to me about that too is the only other people that I really know that have done things like that are, are uh, you're talking big level, like the guys from Top Gear, okay, they went to the North Pole in an Arctic truck same too. Tru you yeah, know same trucks, I mean? yeah. Same trucks, yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. But those guys, that's a little bit bigger deal, right? Like we all know who the guys from Top Gear are. Right. So that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. You did Greenland, right? I did. Yeah. 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 So you can learn about uh, all of the trips on the Expedition 7's website with the exception of Greenland. Greenland was filmed by Clay Croft from Highline Productions, who also does the X Overland okay. uh, travel series that I'm involved with. Clay filmed all that. They made an amazing video, and that's kind of in the process of – uh, it's way above my pay grade, but they're kind of shopping that with networks or okay. however that will be distributed. So one day that whole adventure will be shared because it's pretty amazing. It was, I, I say that being there, so maybe I'm a little jaded, but I, I think, or, or have rosy eyes, but I think everyone would really enjoy uh, that trip, like how, how crazy it was. We, we had fuel brought in by helicopters and planes. Wow. We, uh, you know, we towed all the fuel in bladders on sleds behind us. It was a pretty uh, amazing undertaking. And mm -hmm. uh, Greg actually did all the major uh, logistics planning for that trip. He took that on himself to like... Did he really? He had it to a T. He's a very detail-oriented uh, guy. And Greg is the founder of the Land Cruiser Museum, for those that don't know. Uh, but yeah, he took that on. I mean, all the food prep and all that was prepared in Salt Lake. Mm -hmm. All the, the gear and put on these pallets and these, these containers and shipped to first Iceland, then Greenland, all that had a, there were so many things that had to work out for us to like do this trip and have the vehicles land at the same time, load all the vehicles. And uh, it, it all worked out I think that's overall super cool. amazingly well. Cool. Particularly when you're talking about somebody that actually did that type of planning on their own versus when they, you know, he, he could pay somebody to do sure. that. Yeah. He's one of those guys, right? Yeah. yeah he's, he's, he could have a whole team do, do that, that if we yeah. wanted to, but that's cool that he actually, uh, he did that on his yeah. own. Nope. He took he took so. that on and had a good support network. I, all of us had different roles on the on the trip, but also in some of the planning. But yeah, he he took on the the major planning for all that, and it was neat to see how well it worked. And he was the expedition leader. Had to make a lot of tough decisions about when we turned back and wow. what we did and what we did in, in the event of failures mm -hmm. when we slept. Because I mean, the, the, we spent a lot of time driving, sometimes two and three days at a time, not stopping, mm -hmm. and just sleep till you can't keep your eyes open drive wow. for about another hour after that and then call it quits <laughs> take a nap wow yeah, that is crazy. pretty grueling it's, it's is. type two fun it fun <laughs> to think about now when you were there it was not fun <laughs> yeah but we had smiles everyone got along really well no oh, that's great you just spoke of it x overland is uh -huh. that what it right expedition overland right. yeah. expedition overland. also known as x overland x yeah. overland now that is also something you've been involved with quite a bit mm -hmm. um how many seasons are we at here now they uh well, it's been going for ten, 10 years yeah that is on amazon mm -hmm. they've been doing it for 10 years there's some that are like full season episodes of like much bigger travel log series like uh north america south america central america those are like their own built-in series alaska yukon and then there are series that are like uh, solo trips or families within going and doing their trips so there's kind of a it's a, it's a big broad spectrum of uh, different uh, media that they have produced over the years mm -hmm. Now, where do they go? I know that you did, didn't you go to up to Alaska? You did the Yukon? Were yeah, you I, on that one? I did not do, that was their very oh, first season was, was Alaska Yukon. Season, okay. yeah, and, and I knew Clay at that time, Clay and I, Clay came on the segment we did with Expedition 7 as mm -hmm. the cinematographer when we did the Russia segment, mm -hmm. uh, Siberia, Russia, in the, the Asia series. 
So Clay and I actually flew over there together, and on that trip, what he would they were right in the middle of planning their Alaska Yukon trip, and really excited for him. He had a great group of uh, of friends and family, uh, all from primarily the, the Montana area that were going to be going on that trip. And I was busy; I was doing all the Expedition Seven stuff around the same time. Mm-hmm. I had just finished uh, doing the South America. We we drove from Buenos Aires down to the tip of South America, and then all the way back to Salt Lake in the Expedition Seven's vehicles. Mm-hmm. I had just finished that trip when Clay. They had already done Alaska Yukon, but now they were planning uh, their Central America series to drive down to the Panama as far as south as you can drive. Mm-hmm. And he had just been kind of asking me questions. We'd stayed in contact. And at some point he just said, like, can you just go? Like, you had just done this trip mm-hmm. south to north, but, like, you know the lay of the land and familiar with some of that. So I took on the uh, the, the logistics role of planning that trip for Expedition Overland. So that's an example, yes, like, what, where do we go? We did... Uh, essentially Bozeman, Montana to Yavisa, which is as far south as you can drive in Panama before you get into the thin patch of real estate, the Darien Gap, which is not technically drivable between South America and Central America. A it's gap not of, technically drivable. People have done it, but it's like if uh, it's on the scale of our Greenland expedition to do the Darien oh, Gap. Wow. Yeah, I mean, like it's we're talking. Your, you're, you're making your own road kind of thing. A lot of road building, but also just survival in the jungle. So like it was done by mm-hmm. Mark Smith and Jeeps in 1979 or 81. Somebody's going to correct me on that, but yeah. it's, I've read the story. Really fascinating. Uh, 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 England did it as a military expedition. Uh, Lord, I think Blasford Snell did it. Like it, it's, it's a very legitimate trip to do the Darien Gap, not to mention like the geopolitical issues going on there with, uh, you know, there are some uh, drug cartels working mm-hmm. in that area. There's smuggling going on, but then there's also like the FARC and like Colombian rebels living in that area. So mm-hmm. not a trip we've done yet. We've looked at it. We've talked about it, but maybe one day with some different groups, we will. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so we, we drove all the way to Visa. Then we picked up for the next season later on. And there was like some seasons in between of some local travel or some other stuff. But then we did uh, ship the vehicles to Columbia and drove from Columbia to the tip of South America mm. with Expedition uh, Overland, X Overland. Mm-hmm. We've done Australia, Canada. We went and did uh, the Mackenzie Trail, which is a very popular historic trail in, in Canada. Mm. So we're kind of always looking at some of those uh, big picture historic trails mm-hmm. globally to do for that group. Mm. Nice. Very cool. And mm-hmm. so you, and you've been involved for quite a while on that. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, I think... Uh, five, six, maybe six years now six been years. traveling with X Overland. Yeah. That's not, and cool. I don't go on every single trip, like some of the solo series stuff or the family ones, but I've generally been involved in, in the bigger trips. Nice. That's very cool. It's very cool. Kurt, see, that's the thing. Kurt is a, Kurt, Kurt is an adventurer. I, I get a little jealous of the fact that you are. <laughs> I decided to have four kids instead of, you know that, what I that's mean? That's an adventure. It yeah. is. <laughs> that's quite, an adventure. It is very true. It Sarah, is. Sarah and yourself it's quite an adventure. Yeah, you've got that adventure. So, but it's been, I mean, it's been a great one. So, mm-hmm. but we're like, so our goal is to get out more. We want to do a lot more overlanding and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So we'll definitely have to get you more involved in some of the, get at least resource in some of this stuff. Yeah. Do you have any events coming up that are, that you want to talk about or anything coming up that we should all know about? There's going to be. Yeah, so this cool. year's a weird year, as everybody knows. Last year right. was a really weird year. This mm-hmm. year is somewhat weird as mm-hmm. things start spooling back up and events start happening. Mm-hmm. We just did Cruise Moab, which is an annual Land Cruiser event. How, did, how was it? It was fantastic. Was it? It was awesome. It was different. There was no raffle. There was no group mm-hmm. dinner. Kind of had to scale back uh, what the event was, mm-hmm. but uh, it, it was fantastic. Had a great mm-hmm. time. There were 150 plus registrants, plus you know a lot of people that come down hang out. So it was a, it was a good size event, and it was great to socially responsibly get a hangout with friends again around a mm-hmm. campfire so it was great um but yeah this year now we're starting to see a lot of those events spool back on and canceled events happen and uh one of those that i look forward to every year is one that expedition utah puts on which is called overland skills camp and it's kind of on the same theme we've been talking about okay it's a i'll use the word empowerment event uh, event if you will it's very low cost we've had some great sponsors over the years that have been involved with that like even like uh, Maverick gas stations and some mm. other like kind of cool sponsors that help keep the cost uh, really low. Um, TerraFlex has been involved. Just a mm-hmm. lot of the local partners that you guys would know. Mm-hmm. And that is a training event. So we have classes on how to plan a trip in Utah, how mm-hmm. to use Gaia, which is a like a navigation based app that yeah. a lot of people maybe have, but don't comfortably know how to plan a trip with it. Mm-hmm. We have a class on communications that our good friend Ryan Davis does. He's a nice. ham radio guru. Mm-hmm. And for him, it's so easy to say, yeah, just put a ham in your car. But for maybe a new, someone new to the the sport is like how am i going to talk to each other like i don't know anything about this gear so ryan mm-hmm. teaches about ham radio satellite communication devices the things that you ought to consider not mm-hmm. mandatory to have consider if you're mm-hmm. going to be planning these bigger trips and, and a big trip could be western utah 
We've mm-hmm. talked about it. it's as yeah. remote as there are some places in the world. It's very remote out there. Uh, we have first aid classes, and then we do a lot of recovery classes. How to use a winch, mm-hmm. how to use a high lift. A lot of people buy a high lift, bolt it on the side of their vehicle, and they've never used one. Like yeah. it would be dangerous and scary to use in the real world had you never practiced with it or learned how to. Mm-hmm. I'll go off on a tangent on high lifts. They often get this like denotation of like this dangerous device, but really they're like a fantastic tool Amazing if tools. you know how to use them. Right. Just, yeah. and they, can, they can be dangerous if you do it wrong. and yeah. So can yeah. a screwdriver, right? Yeah. I mean, exactly. like anything's dangerous mm-hmm. if you use yeah. it wrong. Likewise with a winch. A mm-hmm. winch is a oh, great yeah. example. Sorry, yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. Like if you don't know how to use it comfortably, you can and perhaps will hurt somebody mm-hmm. yourself or, or just damage your equipment. And mm-hmm. yeah. nothing's more frustrating than spending all this money on a winch and then b- damaging it mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. you didn't know how to use it properly or you mm-hmm. loaded it wrong or you used the wrong equipment. So uh, that event is every year in the fall. It's put on by Expedition Utah. It's a very modest cost. I, I'm going to throw out a number there. It's like $100 per person, mm-hmm. but that's for a couple days of training, okay. food, camping. Oh, yeah. It's very but, modest, and that's just put on purely to help people that are new to overlanding or mm-hmm. new to exploring Utah and say, man, I would go out, but I just don't feel comfortable because of X, Y, Z. So we give them all of those things in one place to come learn. And you're not going to learn everything in two or three days, but you're mm-hmm. going to learn where those resources are to learn more about the things you need to maybe practice with. Yeah. No, where's, where do you guys do this at? Uh, so his, the last few years and, and could be this year, right in the middle of there's a whole committee that puts that on, okay. uh, deciding that location. The last few years has been in East Carbon, Utah, which is outside of Price. Oh, nice. We've got a fantastic mm-hmm. public land facility that we're able to use in partnership with the city and the, and the surrounding uh, land managers. So it's got camping on side. It's got uh, very light amenities. We mm-hmm. are primitive camping, but that's mm-hmm. kind of part of it is bring your camp gear, live out of your, you know, live out of your gear. We do trail rides coming in, trail ride kind of leaving, just, uh, just kind of all, they're all free part of the, mm-hmm. really all you're paying for is the food and the, the amenities that we have to cover, bringing in bathrooms and bringing mm-hmm. in a tent yeah. and tables and chairs. But uh yeah, so it's been in East Carbon. I'm not sure where it'll be this year. We've mm-hmm. looked at other places, Eureka, Delta, some of the same neat hot spots we've talked about. Mm-hmm. And part of that is uh, East Carbon and that greater area was excited. They, they were excited to have us come to mm-hmm. that neck of the woods because they'd love to see people buying some gas at their gas station, yeah. buying some groceries at their grocery store. And we actually have their, their town grocery store does all our meals. So they're the caterer for the event. Nice. So we try and yeah. that we buy firewood from somebody in town. We try and use that all, all the resources we can from that town. Nice. Is that going to be, so you're probably going to have it in the fall. Mm-hmm. Don't know when though, but that'll be, if, if somebody was interested in doing this, it's yeah. follow Expedition Yeah, follow Utah. Expedition Utah on mm-hmm. any of the social media platforms, yeah. uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram. We do have a, a very active uh, Facebook group, mm-hmm. community group called Expedition Utah Overlanders. Mm-hmm. It has 2,500 some odd members, mostly people in Utah that are planning trips every single weekend. So there is never a shortage of opportunities to go out and travel with other people. Mm. And if, if that's your friction point of, of going on a trip is like, I just don't know where to go or I don't feel comfortable going by myself. That's mm-hmm. legitimate. Go on a trip. Somebody plans. They're usually always looking for somebody to come with them and join, Yeah, you know, a, a, an appropriate group size. So mm-hmm. it's a great way. And we absolutely advertise those. Now, Expedition Utah also has a very active forum. And I know forums are kind of old school, but they actually, right. in a lot of terms, work better than like Facebook is a platform mm-hmm. because of shelf life. Mm-hmm. Because, so Expedition Utah is an amazing resource. If you're going to plan a trip to go ghost towning, you can hop mm-hmm. on there and type any ghost town name in the state of Utah. And I promise you it'll pop up in somebody else's thread about, hey, I visited here and here's what mm-hmm. I saw. There, again, it's not a download a GPS track log and go hit all these check boxes. It's kind of like a help you with the utilities to plan this. But that's mm-hmm. where those events are planned and shared and organizes on the forum or mm-hmm. network through the, the Facebook page. Very cool. Now, are you still going to do uh, Cruiser Outfitters, barbecue? You do these on occasion. Is there mm-hmm. still going to be one of those? Yeah, we'll definitely be back on 2021. Mm-hmm. This year we'll... 2021? Yeah. It's 2021 now. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, like scary just to say that word. I know. Uh, we are going to do one this year for sure. We were not able to last year. The, mm-hmm. We've typically used a big park because of the size of our group. Get a couple hundred people and a couple, you know, hundred plus vehicles there. The city said like, no, not right. happening. Mm-hmm. And that would have been last fall. As we know, everybody was on lockdown and kind of group, large group activities were frowned upon. <laughs> so we did like a little smaller uh, parking lot get together, had the race car there, the kangaroo race car uh, mm-hmm. from our Baja car there. Hadn't even cleaned it up after the, the Baja 1000, so it was fun for people to come see just how beat to death it is after a 1,000-mile desert race. Uh, it, but it was really informal in a parking lot, no food. Mm-hmm. But this year we'll be back on, do a big barbecue, have everybody over. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Am I coming to that? Absolutely. I, I hope. I hope. Everybody's <laughs> invited. <laughs> All right. We'll definitely want to hit that one up. So, well, Kurt, man, uh, I really appreciate you coming on today, man. 
Thanks for this, I think this is a great talk. Yeah, I think it's great. been really you, good. You lived um, up to that uh, walking encyclopedia. Oh, he, he does. Totally. Yeah. He's the man when yeah. it comes to that. It's been confirmed. Yeah, <laughs> it is confirmed. So well, We covered a lot of ground, so I, I, I did a lot of talking. I apologize. That no, was, no. That was that's a lot of ground perfect. we covered. That's the whole, that's the whole okay. point, man. It's just uh, that's the goal of this podcast is to be informative, to have good conversations, to be entertaining. But the key is the inform information. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There's so, much, there's so much rich information. There's so many new people getting to this sport, uh, if you're going to call it a sport or, or pastime, whatever you want to call mm-hmm. it. There's so many people getting into it. And the, I think the key to its success is knowledge. Mm-hmm. I think that's key to just about every bit of success mm-hmm. is knowledge. And the more information I think we can get out there, the better. I, I really seriously appreciate you coming on. Uh, it's awesome chatting with you. I feel like I miss you. I feel like, you know what I mean? <laughs> we like, get a chat I once in a while, but it's usually yeah. a really fast business transaction yeah, chat. Exactly. You know, we're both, it's like, both oh. busy. I get a you know, chat with Sarah real quick on the phone, but it's always like, <laughs> I know. okay, back to work. You've got your things to do. Yeah. Yeah. And we might see each other at a show mm-hmm. for a few minutes. And so it's just great chatting with you. I appreciate you coming on. Awesome to have you. Yeah. Appreciate we will you too having me. Have you back. And uh, everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.